hi and welcome back to my channel today we are going to snow valley snow valley has such a giant spot in my heart it was the first collaboration i ever did with other authors and i actually still have the original book if you want to look at that look how thick that thing is the collaboration was between taylor hart jeanette lewis myself, Cami Checkett, Cindy Roland Anderson, and Kimberly Mopati. Um, we each did, this was the first one, Christmas in Snow Valley. We each did a book around Christmas in the small town, and it was like just the best experience. So we ended up doing one for each season, and then we did a quote reunion book or a return to Snow Valley. And then I actually have one more that I wrote a couple years later to finish out a story that I had promised readers that I wanted to make sure I got done, which was her older brother's best friend's forbidden kiss. Adored Clay. I adored um, Amber and Paisley and just the whole Iron Sticks band members. It originally had planned to do romances for the band members that were single, um, but that just kind of fell by the wayside and didn't get... I wasn't inspired there. I still want to go back one day and do a story based in Clay's recording studio. Just there's a lot. There's a lot that's left here. So anyway, if you have been to Snow Valley before, leave me a comment and let me know. And let's jump into this story. Her Rock Stars Forbidden Kiss A Snow Valley Forbidden Kisses Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell Read by Christina Dimmick. Chapter 1 Nothing says Christmas like freezing your tail off while waiting for someone to turn on the lights, said Paisley, her breath puffing in the air. She stomped her heavy boots on the already compacted snow trying to get some feeling back in her toes. Come on. You know you wouldn't have it any other way, said her brother, Sawyer. He bent over the stroller to tuck the blanket in a little tighter around his baby girl. Paisley smiled down at her niece, Journey, wrapped in fluffy pink from head to toe and sleeping peacefully. Her adorable little nose was the same color as her pale pink blanket. The tiny vision had no idea they were about to kick off the Christmas season with a bang, literally. At eight o'clock on the dot. Snow Valley's mayor would flip the switch to light up Main Street and the huge evergreen tree in the middle of town. Then Buster Wright would set off his vintage World War I cannon two streets away, startling cattle all over the valley and scaring sheep dogs under front porches. Do you think she'll wake up? asked Paisley. Nah, if she can sleep through my drums, she can sleep through Buster's bang. The only reason she can sleep through your drums is because music runs in her veins, said Amber as she squeezed through the crowd. She carried a cardboard cup holder with four steaming hot chocolates in one hand and had her four-year-old son, Peek, balanced on her left hip. As always, Amber looked every bit the rock star. Her clothes, from her high-heeled boots to her thick, fuzzy scarf, were edgy with just the right amount of class. If Paisley didn't love her sister-in-law so much, she'd have to hate her for being so beautiful. Sawyer took his son in one arm and a hot chocolate cup with his other hand and stole a kiss from his wife. That said he appreciated her look as well. Paisley made a face and Peek laughed. Are we bugging you? asked Sawyer. Seriously, I think you two enjoy kissing in front of people. All the world's a stage, said Amber. She and Sawyer tapped their cups together and Paisley rolled her eyes. Amber distributed the cocos, reminding Peek to wait for it to cool off. He blew into the hole in the lid, making an O with his lips. Amber pressed her hand to her heart as she melted at his adorableness. She asked Sawyer, Do you think your mom and dad will come? Sawyer shook his head. Doubt it. Dad didn't sound so good this morning. Paisley looked around for her parents. Her dad threw out his back yesterday when he lifted the turkey from the oven. Thanksgiving dinner wasn't ruined, but the day was one for the scrapbook. Dad ate standing up and mom pestered him to take a muscle relaxer and lay down. Paisley checked the time on her phone. Fifteen minutes to go. 
Anticipating the Christmas magic that sprang to life when the lights came on gave her the same thrill as waiting up for Santa had when she was a kid. In the winters, the sun went down long before 6 p.m. so the parks and rec. Agency set up fire barrels around the town square. Families gravitated together, then called out to friends and chatted as they waited for the official start of Snow Valley's Christmas season. Breathing in the fresh pine scent coming from the 20-foot tree, Paisley tipped her head back to see the stars. Everyone in town knew everybody else and sometimes the familiarity created problems, but tonight, under a blanket of winter stars and warmed by pine-fed fires, Yuletide Goodwill permeated. Paisley checked her phone. Five minutes. If her parents were going to make it, they'd be here by now. She scanned the crowd to see if she could spot her mom's bright blue parka, the one she'd had since Paisley was 13 and was totally embarrassed that her mother would walk around in public in something so old ladyish. She did one last sweep and a movement caught her eye. One barrel over, a cute guy, in jeans and a designer coat, waved at her. Paisley's heart stuttered and she ducked her head, tucking her dark mahogany hair behind one ear. The man's blatant flirtation startled her. She took two quick breaths and dismissed the idea that he'd waved at her. She wore a thick coat and stocking hat. No way was she on her game tonight. He must have been trying to get someone else's attention. She checked over her shoulder to see if anyone waved back, but the Petersons huddled close and stared at the small stage. Someone tapped the microphone and Paisley turned her attention to the front, her cheeks burning with embarrassment at being singled out. As Mayor Carl began a well-rehearsed speech on inviting the spirit of Christmas to Snow Valley, Paisley let her eyes drift back to the stranger. He had to be just over six feet tall with wide shoulders. Dark hair peeked out from under his stocking hat and, heaven help her, curled up in the back. A hint of dark growth on his jaw gave him rugged appeal and Paisley wished she could see what color his eyes were. Please let them be brown. As if he heard her silent plea, he turned to answer by raising one eyebrow and producing a lazy grin with, come hither, written all over it. The firelight illuminated his face with a golden glow. Paisley jerked her attention back to the stage and sipped her cocoa to calm the butterflies in her stomach. They're brown. Deep, dark, gorgeous brown. Dang. Dying to steal another look, Paisley forced herself to face forward, refusing to flirt with him. She didn't know who he was, but she knew one thing. Strangers never stayed in Snow Valley longer than it took to experience Christmas in the town that does Christmas best. After snowmobiling, a romantic ride on the Polar Express, and a few kisses in front of a roaring fire, they'd leave, taking your heart with them. Just as her resolve slipped away, the square lit up with Christmas joy and Paisley jerked at the cannon blast. Sawyer laughed at her, making some comment about jumping like a tourist. She smacked him in the arm, thankful to have something to focus on besides the man with the gorgeous eyes, and smile. And oh my gosh those curls. Paisley stomped her boots again, this time trying to jolt his brown eyes from her memory. As the crowd dispersed, Amber gathered their cups and took Peek to the nearest barrel to watch them burn. Someone called Sawyer's name and both he and Paisley turned toward the voice. To Paisley's horror, her handsome stranger headed right for them. She squatted down to check Journey's blanket and hide the way her cheeks burned. No way! Sawyer grabbed the guy in a bear hug and pounded his back. What are you doing here man? Obviously, Sawyer knew this guy, which made Paisley even more embarrassed she thought he was flirting when he was just being neighborly. For the life of her, she could not put a name with the face. In a town this size, grouping people together as families was easy, but, this guy didn't look like anyone she knew. Not that being a stranger was a bad thing, on him, individuality looked good. He probably thought she was a jerk for snubbing him. Well, she'd have to make up for her inhospitable behavior. Standing up, she put on her friendliest smile. You remember my baby sister? Sawyer asked, pointing at her. 
Thanks for the clue, she thought. She racked her brain, sorting through her brother's old friends, trying to put a name with the hot dish giving her his undivided attention. An old friend could be good, really good. Maybe he'd moved back to town after finishing school and would stay longer than Christmas. This had possibilities written all over it. Their eyes met once again and Paisley's insights melted. How could I forget our biggest fan? He nudged her shoulder. Great, she was back to being baby sister material. Thanks a lot, Sawyer. She shot her brother a dirty look. So much for possibilities. Clay. Amber shrieked and flung herself into the man's arms. Clay. Clay? Paisley took a step back. No way, she said. Looking both ways to make sure no one had heard her, Paisley coughed into her mitten. She glared at Amber, wishing she didn't feel so jealous of that hug. You look positively transformed. What happened to the spikes and black lipstick? asked Amber. Paisley wondered the same thing. The last time she'd seen Clay Jet, he was a skinny 17 year old with black spikes in his hair and a dog collar. The only member of her brother's high school band to try and make a living with music, Clay headed west the day after graduation and hadn't been seen since. The band didn't hold his success against him. Although, there were times when Paisley wondered if Sawyer and Amber envied Clay's gumption. Of course, they sang whenever they got the chance, the national anthem at the Fourth of July picnic, Pastor John's Easter sermon, and no funeral was complete without Amber's rendition of Amazing Grace. But, once they had kids, their family came first. They made parenting look like so much fun, Paisley couldn't wait to have kids of her own. Not that she was in a hurry. All things in God's time, as Pastor John would say. Paisley had seen Clay's dad in town, but never thought to ask about his son. She ran her eyes up and down Clay, taking in the changes that were all good. Even in snow clothes he looked amazing. Who knew there was so much yum under the black eyeliner and hair dye? Sawyer cleared his throat and warned Paisley with a look. She turned away and tried to act as though she hadn't seen him. Sawyer had advised her not to date the guys in the band and Clay in particular. The warning came during her freshman year of high school. She and Sawyer were in the basement, a fresh plate of sugar cookies on the amp and Sawyer tapping his drumsticks against his thigh. Their dad gave permission for Sawyer to use the unfinished basement for band practice as long as he watched Paisley after school. The year she turned 14, a whole new set of rules came into play. They aren't bad guys, but they're a lot older than you. They aren't that much older. Sheesh. I've been hanging around them for four years. I know them just as well as I know you. Well, most of them. Nobody knew Clay. He didn't even hang out with the band at school. He just drifted through the halls in his shredded t-shirts and ripped jeans. Clay's choice in clothing never bothered Paisley, it was his empty eyes she stayed up late at night thinking about. The dullness went away when Clay played his guitar and she loved to see his eyes brighten, like watching the sun rise over fresh snow. The energy took her breath away. We're seniors and you're a freshman. There's a big difference. Paisley walked around the room going through her pre-practice checklist and ignoring Sawyer. She knew where the guys liked to stand and how tall Amber liked the mic. No matter what she did, the height always needed adjusting. Okay? Sawyer pushed. Paisley tightened the mic stand hoping to get it to stay in place this time. You don't have anything to worry about, it's not like any of them would ask me out anyway. Who wouldn't ask you out, asked Bill as he clomped down the stairs. Jeb, Amber, and Clay, followed right behind. Bill had to duck as his feet touched the floor to miss a low-hanging joist. Paisley smiled. When they started the iron sticks, the guys used to reach up and brush their fingers against the beam for luck. Amber gave Sawyer a kiss hello before snagging a cookie. 
Paisley plugged in Bill's keyboard and said, Sawyer's worried I'm going to go all Yoko on you guys. Bill winked at her. I'd ask you out to get your cookies, but since you give them away for free. Paisley's face flushed at his obvious reference to the old saying, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? She concentrated on the soundboard while Bill plunked notes to help Amber warm up her voice. Jeb leaned into his mic, test test. His voice echoed off the cement walls. They talked about throwing up padding to absorb some sound, but Paisley suspected they liked the added volume. Playing in the basement was like singing in the shower. Jeb pulled away and gave her a thumbs up. I'd take you out, but Lizzie's the jealous type. Paisley rolled her eyes. His comment was the equivalent of waiting for pigs to fly. Yeah, like she'd give you the time of day. Jeb shoved a cookie in his mouth and chased it down with a swig of soda. She's just playing hard to get. You wish. Jeb turned to Sawyer, clearly offended. She's like our little sister. Sawyer tapped the symbol three times. Can we just play? Paisley waited at the soundboard as Clay plugged in his bass. He hit a few chords and made an adjustment on his amp. A loud squeal echoed off the walls and everyone covered their ears. Paisley ran over and twisted a knob on the black box. The squeal was replaced by grumbling, but no one threw a dirty look at Clay. No one dared. Sawyer tapped on his snare and then twirled his sticks. Paisley gave Clay a small smile and lifted her shoulders. He leaned in and she could smell the deep scent of men's body wash, a scent she'd recently found a new interest in. You're more than just cookies, Clay said quietly, brushing his fingers up her arm. The connection happened so fast Paisley wasn't sure it happened at all, except that her skin tingled where he'd touched her. She made her way back to the soundboard, wondering if Clay had adjusted his amp so she'd have to come over and fix it. She watched Clay out of the corner of her eye for most of practice. He didn't act like he'd said a word and she decided the zing was their little secret. A secret she'd kept to this day. Paisley absently rubbed her hand up her arm, wondering if he'd thought of her at all since he left town. Sawyer may have had the authority to warn her off the band when she was 14, but she wasn't 14 anymore. If Clay was coming home, she would gladly chair the welcoming committee. The crowd thinned out as Clay listened to Amber and Sawyer's engagement and wedding story, asked about Sawyer's job as an electrician, and met their kids. Clay's eyes wandered to Paisley now and again, but Amber and Sawyer's excitement over seeing their long-lost bandmate was hard to ignore for long. Peek threw a snowball at his dad. Sawyer gave him a stern look followed by a promise to play later. The kid shrugged and continued packing snow anyway. Paisley admired his perseverance. We sent you an invite to the wedding, said Amber, her lower lip pouting out. Clay shuffled his feet. Yeah, I wasn't making much back then. He held up both hands as if weighing his options. Food or bus ticket. But, I wished you guys the best. Although, I'm not sure what you did, Amber, to deserve a drummer for a husband, he said as he shoved Sawyer. I guess it's just bad luck. They joked back and forth, but Paisley's mind was on Clay's excuse, and she wondered what other tough decisions he'd had to make in order to become a success in the music business. Her heart went out to him, alone in a strange city with hardly any money. She would have ached for Snow Valley, especially after getting an invitation to two of her best friend's wedding. Sawyer wasn't sidetracked by the teasing any more than Paisley was. Was it really that bad? Sometimes. Clay glanced at Paisley and then back to Sawyer. But things got better. I'm working in production now. I hope to open my own studio soon. That's fantastic. Sawyer smacked him on the back. We need to get the band together. Bill lives in Boulder, but Jeb took over his dad's place last year. I'm sure we could set something up. How long are you in town? Paisley caught herself leaning closer, hoping he'd say those magic words, I'm home. 
I've got a break between projects, I should be here at least through Christmas. Clay looked her way again and this time Paisley turned her back. Just like she'd thought. They come, they Christmas, they leave. Clay was no different than the rest of the holiday tourists in this town and she had no intention of giving him any more time, or thought while he was here. Come on Peak, let's go build a snowman, she said, offering her hand. She and Peak spent the next fifteen minutes using the snow piled on the sides of the walkway to build the base. Amber interrupted their work and informed Peak it was way past his bedtime. He looked at Paisley and they both groaned in protest as they made their way to the parking lot. Paisley found herself scanning the area for Clay. When she didn't find him, her heart drooped like a pathetic Christmas bow. Looking for someone, asked Amber as she struggled to get the stroller through the snow. Noah Paisley knew she answered too fast. She also knew Amber would pick up on her defensiveness, so she added, I just thought he'd say, goodbye, you know, for old time's sake. His dad called and needed help getting the cows in. They busted through a fence when they heard the cannon. Oh. Well, I guess that's that. Paisley reached down and grabbed the front of the stroller to help lift it over the curb. Amber pressed her lips together as she dug in, her high heel boots, though totally steelin, weren't made for wrestling a stroller through the Montana snowpack. Sawyer's trying to set up a reunion of sorts. Wouldn't that be a kick? Yep. Paisley concentrated on traffic. She purposely didn't ask questions and Amber was too busy gripping the stroller so she didn't slip to press the topic. Between the two of them, they managed to wrangle their way to Amber and Sawyer's SUV. Sawyer arrived a few minutes later as they strapped Journey into the car seat. Peek slept on his shoulder. Once the kids were buckled in, Paisley dashed down the street to her car. It was too darn cold to stand around chatting without a fire barrel nearby. Clay's disappearance didn't stop Paisley from thinking about his easy smile and sultry eyes. She could dismiss his first wave as his attempt to say hi to an old friend. The second smile, the one that practically melted the snow, was harder to write off. Instead of being embarrassed when their eyes met, he looked, well, interested, and flirty, and like someone Paisley would have wanted to spend time with. She scraped a film of ice off the windshield before getting in the car. Her disappointment that Clay hadn't asked for her number surfaced as she put the key in the ignition. It's for the best. She shrugged and turned the key. The heart can only be broken so many times. Chapter 2 Paisley didn't see Clay at all over the next couple of weeks. Not that she wanted to. However, if anyone had asked, she could honestly tell them he didn't attend the Christmas tree parade and craft show the day after the tree lighting. He was not at the Nutcracker matinee performance, nor did he attend Santa's story time where the big guy read the night before Christmas and handed out candy canes. It wasn't like she scanned the crowd everywhere she went or watched for his dad's pickup when she drove through town or anything. She most definitely did not spend several nights contemplating the way her heart beat faster when he'd lifted his eyebrow and smiled at her. That was the moment keeping her up at night. No matter how she tried to spin it, she'd felt something, a connection. A spark? Something whispered to her heart there was more to Clay than some guy breezing through town. As time passed, Paisley resolved to ignore the something and get on with her life. Unfortunately, Clay proved harder to ignore than most guys in Snow Valley, and she hadn't laid eyes on him in days. Of course, in a town as small as Snow Valley, a girl couldn't help but learn a few details. His triumphant return, as Paisley dubbed his unannounced arrival, had stirred up a hornet's nest. Mostly because Sawyer had managed to get the band back together to jam in his living room a couple times over. Since she'd been a part of the band before, people assumed she would be again. At the grocery store, old lady Bergen wanted details. Paisley smiled and said, I haven't been over there yet. Christmas is my busy time at work. Mrs. Bergen patted her arm. That's right, you have the Christmas ball to worry about. 
and the gingerbread house competition, and the cookie decorating party, and the polar bear plunge, thought Paisley. But, the Christmas ball was the town's favorite and brought in the most money for the hospital. Well, I've already bought my ticket and fancy dress, it's green. Can you imagine a woman my age in a red dress? Before Paisley could answer, Mrs. Bergen said, you, on the other hand, would look lovely in red. Thank you. Paisley planned to borrow something from Amber so she would most likely be wearing black. I'm looking forward to the string quartet, said Mrs. Bergen. She set both hands firmly on her shopping cart. Me, too. Paisley smiled as Mrs. Bergen shuffled down the aisle. At the gas station, Brent Osborne wanted to know if he could audition to be a backup singer for the Iron Sticks. Paisley about died when he broke into a heartfelt, but off-key, rendition of Jingle Bell Rock. I think they're pretty set, but I'll let them know you asked, she said as she hurried inside to pay for gas. Paisley decided to steer clear of the whole scene. Sawyer had extended the invitation to join them, stating their desperate need for quality sound checks, but the situation was just too weird for Paisley. She'd outgrown the innocent young girl she used to be and didn't feel the need to go back to a place where she was remembered, or treated like a child. For the Iron Sticks, high school was the glory days and Paisley could see why they wanted to relive them. But she'd grown a lot since then and consequently believed she'd outgrown the Iron Sticks. It wasn't hard to find excuses to give Sawyer. The Christmas tree parade wasn't the only fundraising event this holiday season, and as the hospital's contribution coordinator, she had more than enough work to keep her far away from Sawyer's house, the band, and one bass player in particular. Prepping the elementary school for the annual cookie decorating and gingerbread house decorating contest took up Paisley's whole morning. The new junior pastor in town helped the janitor set up the lunch tables and she lined each one with white plastic tablecloths. The tables sported a variety of red, green, white, blue, and even purple sprinkles. Pinecone and Christmas ribbon centerpieces, made by Mrs. Snow's sixth grade class, held signs designating the age groups for each area. The kids liked to see their friends while they were on Christmas break and worked better when sitting with their classmates. The school left up their construction paper decorations and Paisley added streamers and plugged in the Christmas tree. Entries for the gingerbread house contest poured in. Mrs. Leland said signups were going well and Paisley was glad to see there were more houses this year than ever before. She hurried to the teacher's workroom and copied 15 more entrance forms just in case. Waiting for the dinosaur copy machine to warm up left her just enough time to distribute cookies. Putting them out too early would make them dry, brittle, and not at all suitable for decorating. She was almost done when someone snatched a large star from her pile. Hey. Hey, yourself, said Clay. He took a big bite of the star-shaped cookie. Paisley swallowed. Dang. If Clay in snow clothes looked good, Clay in a turtleneck and jeans looked even better. Paisley took advantage of her front row seat to Clay's broad shoulders and trim waist. His shaggy hair, now free from the stocking cap, hung across his brow and curled around his ears. Clay's eyebrows went up. These are your cookies. He looked around at the stacks and stacks of sugar cookies on the tables. Did you make all these? Paisley was still caught up in admiring Clay's curls. Life was so unfair. How come a guy got rich, and thick, and finger running, wait, what did he say? Cookies, something about cookies. Uh, huh. She dropped her eyes and hurried to add several bell cookies to the table before moving on to the next section. If she had a job to focus on, then maybe she'd be able to talk like a normal person and not like a 16-year-old meeting her heartthrob. Clay stayed with her. I remember these. They taste like home. Paisley put her hand on her hip. Well, if that wasn't the best compliment ever. Home is the closest place to a person's heart you could get. You think? Clay asked. Paisley nodded. 
I should know, Snow Valley is as much a part of me as my family. Clay tried to sneak a reindeer cookie, but Paisley kept the container just out of his reach and laughed at his overly dramatic disappointment. He was such a performer. Paisley considered him for a moment as he took in the decorations and set up for the cookie party. There was more to his transformation than a change of clothes. The heaviness Clay had carried for years was gone. Clay caught her contemplating him. What? he asked. You just seem so different. I'm different, he asked, pointing to his chest. You're the one who's different. Paisley loved his baiting look and knew he was just having fun with her. Please, she scoffed. I haven't had an extreme makeover. Clay grinned. Are you sure? I don't remember you being this tall. Ha! 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 The old Clay was moody and mysterious, but this Clay was playful and flirty, easy to talk to and easy on the eyes. The old Clay may have looked dangerous, but he was safe because he was distant. The new Clay was dangerous in ways Paisley wasn't ready to explore. Clay dropped his teasing tone. There's one thing that hasn't changed, though, he said. Paisley paused. And what's that? You're still beautiful. Paisley's heart stuttered. She cleared her throat. Trying to keep things easy between them, she laughed. Police. I've seen the pictures. Fourteen-year-old me desperately needed a makeover. No way. Fourteen-year-old you was a showstopper. Paisley tucked her hair behind her ear, hoping he couldn't hear the way her heart hammered in her chest. Sure, in the sixth grade Todd Snow told her she was pretty, and there were a couple other compliments along the way, but she'd never thought of herself as a showstopper. She eyed Clay. His expression was open and honest, which unnerved her all the more to know he'd been looking and she was oblivious. It must have been my big hair, she muttered. Changing the subject, she asked, are you here to decorate some cookies? Clay shook his head. My dad volunteered to chaperone a table. He isn't feeling well today, so he sent me instead. Oh. Clay was going to be here all night. Paisley had fun talking to him and would enjoy a whole lot more time with just him, but she'd have to keep her distance or, or what? She bit her lip. Clay must have caught on to her distress because he joked, What? Do I have cookie crumbs on my face? He brushed his stubble. She wondered how he managed to keep his beard short enough to look rugged and yet long enough she didn't think it would prickle, if she brushed her fingertips over it. Not that she would ever do that, she was just noticing. I'm sorry about your dad, is it serious? Nah, he's just feeling his age. Paisley reached the end of the plates and set her almost empty cookie box on the table. There was something else I wanted to ask and I've been told you're the one to talk to. Clay tapped on a chair as he paused for a moment. I wondered what the chances were of the iron sticks playing at the Christmas ball. Paisley burst out laughing. Clay jerked like she'd slapped him and her jaw snapped shut. I'm sorry, you're serious? Yeah, I just think it would be great for the guys if they got a chance to show this town what they're capable of. Paisley shook her head. That's all fine and good, but the Christmas ball is not the place. Paisley picked up the red frosting and retraced her steps around the room, leaving dollops of color in every third bowl. The iron sticks were a big hairband. They screamed into the mics and had wicked guitar solos, but they were not, nor would they ever be, the band to bring this town together on Christmas night. The whole idea was ridiculous. Who ever heard of a punked-out Christmas dance? Paisley shivered. Sure, she enjoyed their music, but plenty of people in town would walk out the moment Sawyer counted out the beat and smacked his drumsticks above his head. She, and the hospital, couldn't afford to have people walk out. Clay snatched up the green frosting and followed behind her, copying her technique. Look, we're good, way better than before. Amber's voice, I mean, it's amazing. No. 
Clay continued as if she hadn't spoken, Jeb was a little rusty, but it's all come back and then some. I don't think so. And Bill, it's like he never stopped playing. Not going to happen. Clay stopped walking. When did you become a stick in the mud? They'd circled the room and the only thing left to do for the tables was distribute the white frosting. She took Clay's tub of green, set it aside, and scooped up the white. I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud. She lifted her chin. The Christmas ball is the one and only black tie event in this town. There's a long-standing tradition of elegance and sophistication and there is no way I'm going to be the one to let that slide. But. This guy could not take a hint. No buts. The iron sticks aren't going to play at the Christmas ball. You'll just have to find some other venue. Clay opened his mouth like he was going to argue, but Paisley waved her frosting spoon to cut him off. She didn't have time for this, not tonight. You'll be with the 12 to 13-year-old kids. Try to keep them under control, they like to pile on the frosting. Also, that vanilla frosting needs to be in those bowls before the doors open in, she checked the time on her phone, three minutes. I have to check on the gingerbread house contest. Good luck and thanks for your help today, she said in a friendly and professional tone. Oh, and watch out for the Adams. Their boys can be rambunctious. She hurried away, but thought she heard Clay mutter, stick in the mud. Let him think what he will, she wasn't going to ruin the Christmas ball by letting her brother's high school rock band, full of overaged shred heads, take center stage. After making sure the gingerbread houses had arrived and were lined up, Paisley brought the judges in. Mayor Carl, Pastor John, and Tom Terry, her boss, filed from the side door where she'd kept them hidden away until the contest participants were ushered out of the room. Judging was meant to be kept secret. She'd devised an intense grading system where each house was rated, on a scale of 1 to 10, in 32 different categories. Once they finished with the judging forms, Paisley would take them out to her parents' house and drop them in the incinerator. Mayor Carl grumbled, this is the worst part of my job. It's not all that bad, replied Paisley trying to keep the mood up. Not that bad? This contest nearly cost me the election last year. He mopped his face with a red bandana. Mrs. Gray was ready to run me out of town. Well, who could have seen that coming? Paisley shrugged. The woman knits hats for premature babies, you'd think she'd be more on the mellow side. I hear it's the quiet ones you have to worry about, joked Tom. Pastor John laughed and threw Paisley a knowing look. He never held the outhouse incident against her, but he remembered. Paisley couldn't help but smile when she thought of her 13-year-old mischievousness and Pastor John's ensuing kindness. The reluctant judges began their dreaded task, debating the merits of using pre-made candies creatively versus making them from scratch. Paisley's thoughts drifted to Clay. She wondered how he was doing with the kids and couldn't help nudging the men to hurry along. When Paisley finished announcing the winners and handed out participation ribbons, she went back to the cafeteria. The room was packed with children decorating Christmas cookies. They paid a small fee for each decorated cookie, got to keep the cookies, and the money was donated to the hospital. She remembered coming with Sawyer to decorate cookies as kids. Many tourist families also attended. Paisley was proud of the extra advertising she'd arranged. Her eyes immediately went to Clay's table, but he wasn't there. Paisley pressed her lips. The Adams twins had arrived. Thankfully, they behaved themselves and seemed more worried about their donkey cookies than about making a mess. She figured she had a few minutes before they lost interest and began looking for alternate ways to entertain themselves. Clay needed to be at his post or there could be trouble. Instead, he leaned against the back wall, talking to Tom. She waved at Sawyer and peeked over at the pre-K table on her way to redirect Clay. Attendance has dropped over the last few years. Tom turned to her. What do you think? 
Paisley held her smile in place despite the way her gut sank to the floor. She had a feeling she already knew the topic of conversation. About what? she asked. Clay thinks we'll get a better turnout at the ball if we shake things up a bit in the music department. Paisley narrowed her eyes. Oh, he does? He mentioned something similar to me. Perhaps it is time to change things, said Tom as he rubbed his cheek. The distant look in his eyes made Paisley believe he contemplated more than just the Christmas ball. For his sake, she hoped he was ready to start dating again, his divorce had been final for almost two years. For the ball's sake, she would die before she let the iron sticks chase away her highest contributors. A rock and roll Christmas ball. Clay's eyes danced in a way Paisley found adorably infuriating. You know, run, run Rudolph, rockin' around the Christmas tree, that sort of thing, he said. Paisley shook her head. This was her pride and joy. She'd spent months agonizing over the details. Paisley prepared to keep her mother bear instinct in check. After all, she could maintain a professional air, even if Clay's persistence was annoying. It's a ball, not a sock hop. Tom continued to rub his cheek. A change could renew interest in the event, bring in a younger set. And, changing the theme could put off some of our regular attendees, countered Paisley. The younger set won't have the financial resources to make up for the larger contributions if we lost them. Nah, Clay swatted away her comment faster than a farm wife after a pesky fly at the family picnic. They grew up with those songs. I'm sure they'd love to hear them performed live. Paisley pressed her nails into her palm. Not only did Clay go over her head when she told him no, he undermined her in front of her boss. He may be some big-shot music producer, but all his success didn't amount to a hill of beans as far as she was concerned. He hadn't been here for almost eight years, and as far as she knew, he'd never attended the ball. He had no experience, no pull, and no understanding of how things worked in Snow Valley and she wasn't about to take his word on the music genre increasing ticket sales. Why couldn't Clay let this go? He had his shot at fortune and fame, and from the rumors floating around town, he'd done well. She couldn't understand why he continued to push the iron sticks when he'd worked with big-name musicians. Paisley brushed her hair off her forehead. When the ticket holders ran from the room with their hands over their ears, she'd be the one with the reputation for ruining the Christmas ball. Nothing she accomplished in her life would ever overshadow the disaster. Not to mention the fact that she'd have to make up for the lost contributions to the hospital before the fiscal year end. She did have one advantage in this debate with Clay, she spoke Tom's language. It's an interesting idea, she said diplomatically. However, at this point in time, an overhaul would be time-consuming and expensive. At the very least, we'd forfeit the deposit on the quartet. Tom's eye twitched and Paisley knew she had him. Maybe next year would be a better idea, he told Clay. Sure. Next year could work. Clay grinned like a coyote. Why don't you two talk it over? I'm going to head home. Wonderful job, as usual, Paisley. The hospital is lucky to have you. Thanks, Tom. As soon as her boss was out of hearing range, Paisley rounded on Clay. You can wipe that smile off your face because it isn't going to happen. Not this year, not next year, not ever. She stomped over to the supplies and grabbed the green frosting. Clay followed, picking up the red this time. Come on, Paisley, don't be mad. Paisley slammed a spoonful of frosting into an empty bowl and a half dozen pairs of seven-year-old eyes looked up at her in shock. She gave them a reassuring smile and kept the look plastered in place while she told Clay, I'm not mad. Clay refilled the red frosting bowl and asked, if you're not mad, then what are you? Paisley moved to the next table, with Clay dogging her heels like a puppy. She wanted to elbow him in the stomach so he'd back off. She glanced around. They were being watched by more than just children now and she didn't want to start any rumors. 
she stopped in front of the table Clay was supposed to monitor and the kids turned in their direction. Paisley kept her voice low. I've been working on the ball for a year and I'm not about to let some guy who thinks he's a rock star ruin all my hard work. Clay considered her for a minute. You need to loosen up. What? I just figured you out. You forgot how to have fun. Paisley bristled. I know how to have fun. I just don't go around ruining other people's efforts in the process. Clay set his frosting tub on the table. Some of the best fun is spontaneous. I can be spontaneous, she replied defensively. Clay reached one arm around her. Her breath caught as his hand pressed the small of her back and she took a step toward him. Really, he asked. Awareness pulsed just under her skin, catching Paisley off guard. Really, she breathed. Prove it. Clay swiped a spoonful of red frosting across her cheek and Paisley's jaw dropped at the cold feeling of Crisco and powdered sugar on her skin. Clay, she said in shock. Clay pulled her closer and Paisley felt as though a million bubbles floated through her toes and out her head. She placed her hand on his chest, not sure if she was trying to hold him back or be closer to him. Clay smelled like cinnamon and aftershave and Paisley found the two a dangerous combination. He gently swiped the other cheek. Play, he said in a husky voice. If Clay's arm hadn't been around her, she would have melted into the floor upon hearing his deep timbre. In the entire mess of mini holiday crisis she'd faced over the last couple of days, she'd always known what to do. If preparedness was her superpower, then being caught up in Clay's embrace was her kryptonite. She was at a loss for how to handle the situation. The only thoughts flitting inside her head were how close Clay was and how he might kiss her and she might let him. A large, vanilla frosting glob landed on Clay's cheek. Food fight, yelled one of the Adams twins. Paisley's first instinct was to laugh, and she would have, if the next glob hadn't landed in her ear. Before she knew what was happening, the whole thirteen-year-old table threw cookies and handfuls of frosting at each other. Paisley scrambled to keep her frosting tub out of their reach. She watched in horror as, instead of protecting his tub, Clay reached in for ammunition. Children at the other tables watched in astonishment, some standing in front of their cookies protectively while others burst into tears. The kids from the older grades tested the cookies' weight in their hands and eyed the frosting bowls. Thankfully, the adults kept the chaos from spreading. With the ammunition spent, the kids collapsed into their chairs, giggling and holding their sides. The whole thing happened in less than three minutes, but the damage was complete. Not one cookie survived. Sprinkles rolled across the floor. Clay looked like an abstract Christmas album cover with red, green, and white frosting smears and clumps. He laughed with the twins as they pointed out their best hits. In seconds, parents ran in from all angles to scold their children. Paisley went into crisis management mode and assessed the biggest threat. Sarah Hamilton was fit to be tied over the state of her daughter's Christmas dress. Paisley stepped forward. I'm sure the color will come out in the wash. I was going to take her for pictures right after this. What am I supposed to do now? Sarah asked as she wiped at the girl's braids with a napkin. Whoa, that's bad. Paisley had no idea how she could fix this one. Clay appeared at her side, wiped his hands down the front of his shirt and whipped out his phone. Let's take some right now. She's adorable and just think of the memories. He snapped a picture of Berkeley's smiling face and showed the screen to her mom. See, these will be so sweet and you'll have a funny story to send out with the pictures. Sarah didn't look convinced and neither was Paisley. He snapped a few more photos. I can send these right to the store and you can pick them up in an hour. Sarah perked up. Did you say an hour? Paisley scowled. Yep. Clay turned and snapped a picture of Paisley who was ready to send him to detention. She swiped the frosting off her cheeks and flicked it onto the table. Mrs. Adams approached, 
holding each twin by one ear. Tell her, she demanded. But mom, I told you, we didn't start it. He did, Graydon, or was it Caden, said as he pointed at Clay. He got her first. I don't care who started it, you apologize. Sorry, they mumbled. What can they do? Mrs. Adams asked. Paisley suppressed a sigh. Why don't they roll up the tablecloth and pick up the cookie pieces? Several other parents offered their kids help with the cleanup and Paisley had them wipe down the chairs as Clay continued to snap pictures and offered to send orders to the local Photoshop. It was my fault, Mrs. Adams. I encouraged them, said Clay. Mrs. Adams' shoulders relaxed. My boys are far too eager to jump into trouble. Paisley fumed. She'd warned Clay the twins were a handful and he didn't listen. Just like he didn't listen about the Christmas ball. Now, he was jumping in like he'd spent nights on end making sugar cookies and frosting. He was an event pirate coming in to commandeer her cookie party. Thank heavens he'd missed the Christmas tree parade and craft show fundraisers. When he began posing with the Adams twins, who put on angelic faces for the camera, Paisley stomped off to find a broom and a mop. Someone had to clean up the mess and she doubted that someone would be Mr. Fun with frosting. She could not believe she allowed herself to lose focus at an event. Sure, Clay was good-looking to the twelfth power, and his arm felt comfortable and right wrapped around her. And, she might have wondered, for a split second, what it would have been like to have play. She pressed her hand to her forehead. Her infatuation with Clay was no reason to let things slide. She should have been in control. Her cheek tingled where he'd swiped frosting. Probably from the sugar and not at all a reaction to his touch. Several large frosting chunks clung to her hair, swinging heavily when she turned her head. Disgusting. She wanted nothing more than a warm shower and a full shampoo bottle. Before she could even consider cleaning up herself, she needed to clean up the school. The principal would have a fit if she saw this mess. Paisley fumbled around in the supply closet, shoving buckets aside and trying to find the mop that didn't give a girl splinters. When Clay appeared behind her, Paisley exercised great self-control and didn't sweep him right back out the door. His white teeth flashed. They're on their way over to Sue's photo to pick up their orders. He held out his phone. You need to see these, they turned out so good. Paisley pushed his hands away. I don't care about the pictures. What? Why not? Storming past she was careful not to bump him, he was even more frosted than she was. Thanks to you, I get to spend the next hour mopping up sprinkles. Clay grabbed her elbow. I'm sorry. I didn't mean for things to get out of hand. Yeah, you tried so hard to stop it. Stop trying to be a big shot, will you? I don't want to get caught in the crossfire. She gestured to her dark green shirt, now covered in red, green, and white, globs and flecks. Clay rocked back. I'm not trying to be a big shot. Right, like you don't love being the hottest topic of conversation in Snow Valley. I thought that's what musicians wanted, their name on everyone's lips. I don't, wait, have you been talking about me? Clay smiled. Paisley threw her hands in the air. Forget it. I've got a floor to clean. Clay reached for the splinter mop and Paisley didn't feel like warning him. Let me help. Better yet, why don't you do it all? She set the bucket at his feet. Okay. What? She snapped. Clay held up his hands. Nothing. Paisley spun, trying for a dramatic exit, slipped on a stray glob of white frosting, and almost fell. She glared over her shoulder, daring Clay to laugh. Hey, Paisley, he called just before she turned the corner. What? For the record, you look good in frosting. After everything he'd put her through, he even riled up the Adams twins, she'd have to sit on them next year to keep them in line, 
Clay had the nerve to flirt with her. Paisley wanted to scream. You're impossible, she said. So I've been told. As far as Paisley was concerned, the sooner Clay left town the better. Chapter 3 Breathe, Mrs. Bloom. Deep B-R-E-A-T-H-S, said Paisley as she held an oxygen mask over the woman's mouth and nose. Since the hospital was small, the local doctors were on call for emergencies and trained volunteers were an important part of activities like the polar bear plunge. As a hospital employee, Paisley wanted to do her part. Mrs. Bloom gave her a thankful look and put her hand over the mask so Paisley could let go. She and Sawyer opted to treat Mrs. Bloom in the warm-up tent in case they needed the ambulance waiting outside for an actual emergency. I thought you weren't plunging this year. Sawyer asked as he placed a heavy blanket, tinged with the antiseptic smell that coated medical supplies, over her shoulders. I've been training in the bathtub, Mrs. Bloom said through the mask. I thought I would be able to stay in this year. Paisley shook her head and Sawyer rolled his eyes. Sawyer had worked the polar bear plunge as an EMT ever since he completed his training, right after high school graduation. Paisley got her certification when she started working at the hospital. Together, she and Sawyer had treated Mrs. Bloom for shock three years running. The poor woman never made it past her knees before she hyperventilated and her system revolted against the frigid temperatures. When Clay walked into the warm-up tent with his dad, Jonathan, Paisley's temperature went up three degrees. She couldn't think about the cookie disaster, as she had aptly named Clay's food fight, without her blood boiling. The kid's parents loved the pictures Clay engineered and took every opportunity to tell her so. Sarah even asked if she could put in a photo booth next year because Clay's idea saved her so much time and made such a fun memory for their family. Paisley begrudgingly agreed a photo booth would be a good idea, one more way to bring in money for the hospital. Even with Sarah appeased, Paisley fumed that Clay had almost ruined her event. Clay pulled his shirt over his head and winked at Paisley. Paisley's breath caught at the sight of his muscular physic and she turned away before he caught her staring. Great, she thought, one more Clay moment I won't be able to forget soon. She hadn't spoken to him since the broom closet and she wasn't about to start now. He could just stay on his side of the tent and she'd be more than happy to stay on hers. Paisley focused on Mrs. Bloom, but couldn't stop herself from taking a peek at Clay in a swimsuit. She scowled at his sculpted chest and easy grace. No one should look that fit, it was December for crying out loud. Time for cookies and chocolates and definitely not time for swimsuits and cut ABS. Ugh. He was infuriating. Thankfully, his dad hauled him out before he could flirt with her again. Once Mrs. Bloom was breathing on her own and settled into a folding chair with a hot chocolate, Paisley and Sawyer went back to the river's edge. Sawyer carried their supply bag and Paisley held a backboard. This is madness. Paisley scanned the crowd of polar bears running in and out of the frigid river water, watching for signs of trouble. Rarely did a person thrash around before they went under. More often than not, they simply slipped beneath the surface. After the first wave of plungers, there was no control over who went in and who came out. No way to count bodies. No way to verify someone wasn't sucked downstream. The chaos grated against her skin like 150-grit sandpaper, but she held her irritation at bay, so she could keep a clear head. Who started this tradition anyway? asked Sawyer. Paisley shielded her eyes with her gloved hand. Our illustrious founder Benjamin Snow. Back then, they used to think plunging was good for the circulatory system. Graham and Gramps plunged, before they had mom. A cry for help sounded. Both she and Sawyer whipped around. Twenty feet downstream a couple of guys hauled someone out of the water. Paisley broke into a run, the snow crunching under her boots' thick tread. Landing on her knees, she situated the plastic backboard on the snow. The men positioned Jonathan Jett on his back, unconscious. His breathing was shallow and rapid and his skin was bright pink. At least he's breathing. Dad. 
Clay dropped to his knees next to Sawyer, his eyes wide and pleading for his dad to wake up. Dad. He grabbed his dad's shoulders, giving them a good shake. Sawyer pulled him away. Did he go under? What? Clay stared at Jonathan. Paisley took Jonathan's pulse and checked for external injuries. Did he go under? Sawyer demanded. No, a Clay blinked. No. I don't think so. Good. Sawyer dropped his hands from Clay's arms and hurried to place an oxygen mask over Jonathan's face. Paisley secured a neck brace and strapped him to the board, her hands steady. If Jonathan didn't go under the frigid water, he had a much better chance of survival. She counted his clear lungs as a small miracle, considering the cases she'd studied. We need to get him to the ambulance, she said. Sawyer nodded. Without instruction, six men in swimsuits and bare feet lifted the backboard and took off at a light jog. Paisley fell in step with them, sweat building up under her heavy coat. The other plungers stepped aside, Jonathan's name whispered among them as they realized the situation was serious. What happened? Paisley asked Terry, the guy on the back left handle. I don't know. Ask Clay. Clay, she called. Here. He was right behind her. No matter how angry she was at him over the frosting incident, she wanted to help his dad. She didn't wish any heartache on Clay, he'd already been through enough. Did you see him go in? We went in together. They reached the ambulance and Pete, the driver, had the back doors open and was already pulling out the gurney. Clay stopped his account to help get his dad situated. The sound of the gurney's metal legs clanging echoed over the snow. Sawyer shoved her and Clay in the back, shut the doors, and banged the OK for Pete to go. He'd stay behind with their essentials bag in case someone else needed help. Keep going, Paisley prompted Clay as she unwrapped an four bag and tubing. He splashed me. I laughed, he froze and fell into me. It happened so fast. I, I struggled with him in the water and called for help. That's when the other guys helped me haul him out. What's wrong with him? The ambulance bounced from the dirt road to pavement and Paisley concentrated to insert the four. She hooked up the fluid and opened the valve. There are warm blankets in that compartment. She jerked her chin to show Clay which direction to look. Let's get him covered. Paisley hurried to get Jonathan hooked to the monitor before Clay covered him. She talked to keep them both calm. People sometimes go into shock because of the cold. The blood vessels in the heart constrict and they have chest pains. Their muscles are cold and because they have a hard time pulling in air, they can become temporarily paralyzed. He's paralyzed? Clay wiped at his face. Paisley checked Jonathan's pulse. Weak and thready. Hang on. She prayed he'd remain steady until they got him to the doctor. She was scared. There was always one or two cases of shock or near frostbite at the plunge, but she'd never seen anything this bad. Pushing her fear deep inside, she stayed calm for Jonathan and Clay. It usually wears off as they warm up. We won't know until the doctor has a chance to look at him. Here, she handed Clay a towel. Dry his head. Clay grabbed onto her hands, their eyes meeting. Is he going to be okay? asked Clay. Paisley didn't see the cocky guy who winked at her, or the playful one who swiped frosting on her cheek. Paisley gazed into the eyes of a vulnerable 15-year-old who showed up on the first day of band practice, not knowing if he belonged, but needing a place where he felt secure. We'll do everything we can. She turned to check the flow on the floor and then went back to briskly rubbing Jonathan's arms and legs. Clay wiped water out of his dad's beard and hair. The, um, doctor and a nurse met them at the door and rushed Jonathan away. Paisley was left standing next to Clay at the triage desk as Pete took the ambulance back to the river. The ride into town had been the longest 20 minutes of Paisley's life. 
Knowing Jonathan and Clay's hope rested in her abilities and training left her drained. She just couldn't seem to put one foot in front of the other to take her to the seat. Clay shivered and Paisley came out of her haze to realize he didn't have any clothes on, well, besides his swimming trunks, but those weren't doing him much good. His feet were bright red. The heater in the ambulance hadn't been enough to keep him warm and here in the waiting room, goosebumps broke out on his skin. If he wasn't careful, they'd be treating two jets today. Has he been sick? Susan, the receptionist, asked. No. Paisley stepped forward. Wait, you said you had to come to the cookie party in your dad's place because he wasn't feeling well. Water dripped off Clay's hair and to his bare shoulders. Paisley kept her eyes locked on his so she wouldn't be tempted to watch where the water landed. Clay broke eye contact. He hasn't been sick, he repeated. I told him to stay home so I had an excuse to see you. He turned back to Susan and gave his dad's billing address, too focused on her questions to notice Paisley's shock. She stood there with her heart hammering and her mouth hanging open. I'll be right back. She wasn't sure if Clay or Susan heard her or not, but didn't really care. It wasn't how it sounded, she reasoned as she made her way to the supply cupboard. He hadn't come to see her, he'd come to the cookie party to talk to her about the iron sticks. That was it. He was there for the band. She paused at the supply cupboard. But, if it was all for the band, then why did he pull her close and let his voice get all rumbly? Shaking herself out of the memory, she found some clean scrubs and pulled a blanket from the warmer. When she got back, she wrapped the blanket around Clay's shoulders without interrupting. He gave her a faint smile. Susan promised to let him know as soon as she heard anything. Paisley handed Clay the scrubs and showed him to a curtained area where he could change. She turned her back to the fabric and said, I hope they fit. They'll be great. Thanks. She looked up at the water stains on the ceiling and then down at the tiles. Holding still was driving her insane. She rummaged through a few drawers before she found some hideous green socks with white traction lines on the bottom and a plastic bag for Clay's swimsuit. By the time he was done changing, she also had another blanket fresh from the warmer. It was a good thing too. Even though he had on dry clothes, Clay shivered from head to foot. He used the first blanket to dry his hair and Paisley bit back a smile as the curls bounded out in all directions. He tucked the new blanket around him and took a seat in the waiting area, his elbows on his knees and his fingers buried in his hair. Paisley paced. The old battery clock on the wall said 1144. The plunge ended at noon and then Sawyer would come back with the ambulance, with any luck, an empty ambulance. They would then restock the supplies and make sure the ambulance was in order before heading home. She had less than seven days before the ball and there was still a lot to do. The most stressing errand was confirming the Christmas quartet. She'd sent two emails and hadn't heard back. It was time to make a phone call. There was also the not-so-small issue of the Christmas tree in front of the hospital. Addie Hayes, church service committee chair, should have had the huge pine decorated days ago. When Paisley asked Pastor John if she should find someone else, he said, the Lord's working on it, don't rush him. Paisley decided to just let the tree be. If the Lord was in charge of decorating, she wasn't going to meddle. The band, on the other hand, was her responsibility. As she walked past Clay, he snagged her wrist. Can you please sit down? You're making me nervous. Paisley plopped into the seat next to him. She bounced her leg and Clay put his hand on her knee to stop her. Hold. Still. Do you want a drink? I could go get us some soda or something. There's a machine down the hall. Just sit. Paisley drummed her fingers on the seat. I'm trying to help. Clay leaned in close. Not as close as when he asked her to play, but close enough Paisley could see the variations of brown in his incredible eyes. No. You're trying to control the moment, he said. 
Paisley didn't like his tone. I don't know what you mean. If you're busy you don't have to feel anything, but if you stop moving, stop planning, you might, heaven forbid, worry. Well, guess what? I want to worry. I want to stress over my dad. He's all I have, Paisley, and I want to care about him enough that I hurt to think I might lose him. I don't want to be shut off. He motioned at her, implying she was shut off and Paisley's jaw dropped. She wasn't shut off. Her love for Snow Valley and the people who lived here inspired her to work hard. Balling her fists, Paisley said, if I didn't work so hard, this hospital wouldn't have the new EKG machine they've probably hooked up to your dad. If I didn't plan, then they wouldn't have the funding to pay the doctor. If I didn't keep busy, you'd be sitting here half-naked and freezing. Because I plan, people like you can feel things all day long. I don't have that luxury. Clay's jaw tightened and Paisley jumped to her feet. And, just for the record, I care about people and there are plenty of people in this town who care about me. Unlike you, I didn't run away. Paisley. Sawyer scolded her from the doorway, sounding every bit as angry as her dad did the time she took the pickup without asking and grazed a fence post on her way into town. She threw her hand over her mouth, mortified. She'd lost her cool and allowed Clay to get to her once again. Sawyer crossed the room and held out her purse, his lips pressed into a thin line. She took her bag, knowing her keys, and her exit, were inside, but unable to storm off. She wasn't a person who intentionally hurt someone and she wanted a chance to apologize. Sawyer handed Clay a bag, which Paisley assumed had his and his dad's clothes and personal items from the warm-up tent. They didn't have time to gather them when they jumped in the ambulance. She shuffled from one foot to the other, wanting to defend herself to her big brother and apologize to Clay at the same time. Have you heard anything? Sawyer asked Clay, ignoring Paisley. Clay shook his head. Susan's white orthopedics squeaked against the tiles. Clay, honey, your dad's awake. He'd like to see you. Clay jumped up, leaving the blanket on the seat. He turned to pick it up, but Paisley beat him to it. You're good, go, she said as she draped the now cold fabric over her arm. Thanks. Clay hurried off, leaving Paisley and Sawyer in the waiting room. Are you going to stay? Paisley folded the blanket into a neat square and hugged the cool fabric to her chest. I'll make sure Jonathan is stable before I leave. I think Clay needs a friend right now. His voice didn't hold an ounce of accusation, but Paisley felt guilty anyway. The regret grew as she remembered the look in Clay's eyes as he told her his dad was all he had. He wasn't running away, you know. Sawyer settled back into the chair Clay vacated. He was chasing a dream. There's a difference. Paisley sat on the edge of her chair. I know. I was just angry. He gets under my skin. Sawyer smiled and leaned back. I noticed. What? The way he gets your goat. He's impossible. Sawyer laughed. I also saw the way you two got all cozy at the cookie party. Paisley narrowed her eyes. We were not cozy. Hmm. And you weren't checking him out this morning over Mrs. Bloom's oxygen treatment. Paisley smacked his arm. I did no such thing. Besides, you told me a long time ago band members are off limits. I did and for good reason. Sawyer looked up as he weighed his words. Did you know Mom was the one who invited Clay to practice? No, it Paisley scooted back against the chair. She was friends with his mom. I remember her taking dinner over Wednesday nights for almost a year as Terry went back and forth from the hospital. How did she die? I don't know. If I did know, I don't remember. You'd have to ask Clay. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. Sawyer shrugged. Anyway, over the next year, Clay started wearing black. He dropped off the basketball team and didn't try out for baseball. 
It was weird. We'd played on the same teams since first grade and then all of a sudden he just wasn't there. By the time we hit ninth grade, he wore leather cuffs and I make up to school. None of us wanted to go near him, let alone hang out with him. He shook his head in admiration as he said. Mom pulled me aside after our first practice and told me we needed a bass player and she knew just the guy. I about pitched a fit when she said Clay knew how to play. I told her I didn't want him in the band and she said I had to give Clay a fair shot or she'd shut us down. I thought there was no way he'd stick with us, he'd flaked out on everything else. But he did. He was on time for practice and man, could he play. We tried to catch up to him and he just kept getting better at the guitar, but he never got better inside. Do you know what I mean? Paisley nodded. She remembered the haunted looks and the way he let her mom hug him. Goodbye. After practice, like a man starving for a meal who only gets a morsel. He didn't want to feel, so he shut himself off. No wonder he wanted to feel things now. For years he hid behind black hair dye and fingernail polish. Was that what she did? Was she hiding? Paisley bit her lip. When I saw him at the tree lighting, I found my friend again, the one who played basketball and swung at the worst pitches, he was back. He's not the same guy who left here. Paisley smoothed the blanket. What are you saying? I'm saying, Sawyer tapped her shoulder, he's not off limits anymore. Paisley squirmed. It doesn't matter if he's off limits or not. He's leaving after Christmas, so there's no point in making a big deal. Sawyer scratched his temple. I'm not sure he's Dash. Ahem. Clay stood in the doorway. Paisley's heart picked up speed. How long had he been standing there? Dad's okay? He went into shock, just like you said. Clay nodded to her. Paisley's shoulders relaxed. The doctor said he's going to be fine. They want to keep him overnight for observation as a precaution. Sawyer stood up. I'm glad he's doing well. You'll call if there's any change? Yeah, man. Thanks for hanging out. Anytime. Sawyer punched Clay's shoulder. I'm going to check the supplies in the ambulance and then head home. Amber's parents are coming for dinner and then we're taking the kids on the Polar Express. He hugged Paisley. Be nice, he said loud enough for Clay to hear. But, not too nice, he whispered. She gave him an extra hard squeeze, making him grunt before letting him go. Both she and Clay watched him leave before turning to face one another. Clay ran his hand through his amazing hair that had somehow calmed down from Frisville to once again holding the perfect wave. His kids were going to be so lucky to get his hair and his eyes. Those warm, chocolatey-colored eyes wouldn't let her go. They held her there, his earlier anguish gone, replaced with a look that was less raw and much more welcoming. Thanks for your help, he said quietly. Oh, you know, it's all part of the job. Clay came closer. Speaking of your job, when I walked in they had Dad hooked up to the EKG machine. I, I thank you, for planning. I always knew there was more to you than cookies. Paisley touched his arm. She concentrated on her words instead of the tingling spreading through her fingers. I'm sorry for what I said. A slow, easy grin spread across Clay's face and Paisley realized he wasn't the type to hold a grudge. Perhaps he thought life was too short, or maybe he'd always been forgiving and no one ever took time to find out. It's okay, he said. You're pretty when you're angry. Paisley gave him a playful shove. It's a good thing you think so, you make me angry more than most people. Like my dad always says, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. She shook her head. You are impossible. Yeah, I kind of am, but I'm good with it. Paisley handed him the blanket. If you're all set then, I'm going to take off. Things to do? Always. I'll see you later, he said. Paisley paused. 
The way his voice lifted didn't sound like the cursory good. Bye, people say. It sounded more like a hopeful question. Like an I want to see you later thing and Paisley felt the bubbles, as strong as a jacuzzi set on high, start up inside. Only this time, instead of melting into him, like she did at the cookie party, look how that turned out, she tamped down hard. Clay may have changed, may be gorgeous, and may be the type of guy she wouldn't mind running into under the mistletoe, on accident. Of course, but he was leaving and she couldn't let him take her heart with him. Not like Brent. Brent, a fly-by-night tourist with a chiseled jaw and a lifted truck, had made her feel like the most attractive woman in Snow Valley. When she asked him to stay, he'd laughed and told her Snow Valley was good for two things, snowmobiling and smooching by the fire. But, a man got tired of both of those and had to head back to real life in the city. His words left a scar on Paisley's heart. So, instead of stepping closer and giving Clay a quick hug, which she couldn't guarantee herself would be quick, short, or not, too nice if the bubbles erupted again, she gave him a small wave and walked out the sliding glass doors. Chapter 4 Hi Alfred, this is Paisley Hackett. I'm calling from the Snow Valley Hospital Christmas Ball to confirm our arrangements. Please give me a call back at your earliest convenience. Thank you. Paisley hung up the phone and tapped it to her forehead. She'd been trying to confirm the quartet for the ball, but couldn't get their manager, Alfred, to answer her calls. Part of her was on the verge of a come undone, the other part told her not to panic. Alfred was never easy to get a hold of. He managed the band on the side and still had a 40-hour-a-week day job. He'd get back to her soon. She checked the time. 5.30. Time to head home and get some dinner. The model railroad convention was in full swing and Main Street would be crawling with participants and their families looking for something to eat. Her other option, the frozen dinner she'd brought, didn't sound all that appetizing. She'd done it again, she'd planned out her day, down to the minute. Was there something wonderful she'd missed? Maybe there was someone she was supposed to meet out there on the street. She could be sequestering herself in the office, while other people had an amazing evening. She hadn't been to the train show since she was a child. What if this was the best train show ever, the one people talked about for years to come, and she missed the memories because she planned her way around traffic? Then again, maybe someone had brought donuts in and her dinner waited in a pink bakery box in the break room. Going with the shortest route to food, she walked down the hall and pushed open the door to the break room. She wasn't disappointed to find an open box, with half the donuts still available. Taking her time, she didn't have to drive anywhere and the only thing waiting at her desk was more work. Paisley selected a chocolate cake donut. Cake donuts had more heft for dinner whereas regular donuts were for lighter meals like breakfast or lunch. There was chocolate frosting on top and chocolate frosting was the best. There were Christmas sprinkles, which reminded her of Clay, even if she shouldn't be thinking about him. She grabbed a bottle of water and headed back to her cubicle in case Alfred decided to call back. As she settled in, Susan paged her. Paisley, Clay Jet's here to see you. Paisley panicked. She rubbed her napkin across her lips and opened the top cupboard to check her face in the hidden mirror. Being covered in frosting and sprinkles after a food fight was one thing. Being covered when you ate donuts for dinner was quite another. Paisley? Susan asked. Send him on back, Paisley said as she swiped on some lip gloss and pressed her lips together. Squinting at her reflection she decided ultra-shiny lips made her look like she was trying to impress him. She blotted her lips on the napkin. She was not trying to impress Clay Jet. Without giving Paisley enough time to catch her breath, Clay stood in her doorway with a messenger bag over one shoulder and a white poinsettia in his hands. Hey! She pointed to the chair on the other side of the desk. What's up? Dad wanted to say thank you for yesterday, so he sent you this. Clay set the poinsettia in the middle of her desk, the red foil crinkled. Aww, 
That was nice of him. How's he doing? Great. He came home today and wanted to go out and do chores. Paisley laughed. She knew he'd gone home, she checked in with Doc Taggart, the old one, not the new one, first thing this morning, but she was relieved to hear he had some spunk. Tell him thank you. I will. Clay sat down. Paisley moved the flowers to the side so she could see Clay. He opened his bag and handed her a small box of chocolates. Your dad didn't have to do all this. These are from me. Oh. I'm trying to butter you up. Well, you pick the right type of butter. These are my favorite. Wait, what do you want? Clay chuckled. Don't stress. He pulled out a laptop. Since you're so good at planning. Paisley cringed, remembering the heated words they'd both said over the last two days. She was sure Clay thought she was unhinged. Yet, he'd come looking for her and acted as though things were good between them. I wondered if you could help me with my business plan. Paisley tipped her head. Business plan? Clay leaned forward and put his elbow on her desk, the computer resting in his lap. I want to open my own recording studio, but to get the equipment, I need a loan. Paisley jumped in. And, the bank wants to know what you're going to do with their money? Right. He tapped his temple. I've got the whole studio worked out up here. I just can't seem to get the information to come out. Have you ever done something like this before? Not exactly, but I've created budget reports for the board. Maybe I can draw on that experience. Let's take a look at what you've got. If he'd asked her for anything else, she wasn't sure she would have helped him. So far, he'd run over the top of her to talk to Tom, ruined an event, and called her, shut off. Yet, here he was, asking for her help and looking at her like she knew what she was doing. She decided to roll with it. She released her anger over the frosting fight like a kid letting go of a balloon. Clay was right, life was too short. It's rough, Clay warned as he opened his laptop and brought up the right file. He swiveled the screen around and Paisley scanned the first page in silence as Clay leaned forward. Paisley found it difficult to concentrate with him staring at her, but she managed to read through the first section. Okay, I see where you're going. If I were an investor I'd want to know where these numbers came from. She pointed to one chart and waited. Clay started talking and she slid the keyboard closer to type. She continued to ask him questions, and he had all the right answers. His eyes lit up with possibilities as he explained the services, and the chance to discover a new sound or group. He went from sitting, to standing, and back again. When she asked a hard question he talked it through, as much to himself as to her, and she gathered the ideas, editing as she went. The more she heard about his studio the more excited she got. From the sound of things, this was a viable business. With the contacts Clay had in the music industry, names she encouraged him to use in the presentation to give his claims credence, he could make a go of this. He needed the loan for the upfront costs. There would be annual upgrades to software and some equipment, manageable expenses in Paisley's eyes. Managing the business would take a heavy hand. There were so many steps before a group could even get in the studio, let alone produce an album. The process fascinated her and Clay knew the business inside out and upside down. Once she'd quizzed him until he looked ready to drop, she adjusted her position in the seat and got to work on the document. What are you doing? Clay asked. She glanced up. I'm making the presentation look pretty. Smiling, she went back to work. Are there any more of those? He pointed to the half-eaten donut, forgotten, at her elbow. Paisley couldn't eat when there was work to be done. You'll have to check the break room. Clay stood and stretched. Wait. Clay paused, his hand resting on her desk. Favorite color? Why? I need a theme. Um, red. 
I would have guessed black, she said before she thought about how rude she sounded considering the way he used to dress. Nope. His eyes flicked to her red shirt and then back up. Definitely red. Paisley flushed as she realized he was flirting again. He reached up and brushed her cheek. Pink's nice too, he said. Then he pushed off the desk and disappeared into the hallway. She gave herself a mental shake. He wasn't going to be here for long. She wondered if he was like that with everyone. Artistic types could be touchy-feely, couldn't they? Didn't they all kiss hello? Goodbye. Congratulations, thanks for the coffee, and whatnot. Then again, Clay wasn't what Paisley would consider overly friendly with others, at least not when she was around. She brushed her hand across her forehead. She didn't know what to think. Life outside Snow Valley was uncharted water and she'd never cared enough to so much as dip her toes in the tide. She loved the way people in Snow Valley stepped up to help out. Whether a soccer team needed a coach or they were short on floats for the 4th of July parade, there was always a neighbor happy to pitch in. Towns like Snow Valley were few and far between. Paisley knew she had a good thing here and she wanted to hold on to it with both hands. Clay had jumped into the world with both feet. Whatever he'd found out there had helped heal his wounds, and for that Paisley was grateful. Just because her heartbeat skipped and her skin tingled when they touched, didn't mean he felt the same way. She scrubbed at her cheek to make the tingle stop and dove back into the project. The proposal came together nicely. She moved the three-year overview behind the first-year profit projection and changed the heading font to orange. Clay came back with the whole box of donuts. You're supposed to take what you'll eat and leave the rest for others. I did. He moved around the desk so he could look over her shoulder. I thought I said red. Paisley shook her head. When it's not Christmas, red is an aggressive color. It represents anger. We do not want investors getting angry or fearful while they read your proposal. Orange is creative and driven. I think the color fits. Clay lifted one eyebrow and Paisley was grateful she was already sitting down, otherwise her knees would have given out. Dang. We, he asked. She turned back to the screen. I'm kind of invested in this. You think it's a good idea? I mean, I think it's good, but I'd love to know what you think. Paisley turned to look up at him. I think the studio is a viable business with the potential to be as big as you want to take it. This plan, if you do what you say you'll do, will set you up. You'll be turning some big numbers within three years. I think the bank will jump on board. He put one hand on the back of her chair and leaned down to see the screen. Cinnamon and sugar filled Paisley's senses. How did he manage to smell like Christmas, home, and adventure? Her fingers paused over the keyboard and she closed her eyes. Paisley? Hmm. <laughs> you okay? Just thinking. Just thinking about how good your arm felt around my waist and how sweet you smell and how my fingers would feel in your hair. This looks good, said Clay. Paisley opened her eyes to see his cheek not far from her face as he leaned in to scroll down. He was intent on the information, but all Paisley could see was him. Having him close shorted out her circuits. I can't believe it's the same proposal. He turned to look at her. Did you do all this while I was in the break room? Paisley giggled and then wanted to die. There was no reason she should giggle over Clay. Yet, being near enough to share body heat, she was light and airy, and apparently airhead because she still hadn't answered the question. I typed while you talked. Your passion for the studio and music transferred onto the page. He looked at her dubiously. Forcing her eyes away from Clay, and effectively removing the need to giggle, she leaned over the computer and began proofreading. They're your words. I just formatted, she said as she skipped over the section regarding the location and property. She didn't feel right offering advice on something she didn't know anything about. Clay stood up and made his way around the desk. 
You have a gift. She laughed and then felt her smile fade away like footprints in a snowstorm. She'd done it again. She'd used her ability to focus on one thing to block out another. In this case, she blocked her feelings for Clay because she didn't want to face the fact that she was attracted to him on so many levels. It wasn't just Clay's rugged good looks or the way his smile melted her into Christmas pudding. He brought out the best in Paisley and helped her see herself as more than an event calendar. He didn't make blocking him out easy. The man smelled like Christmas, for the love of Pete. What would have happened if she'd given in to those feelings, let go of her plan to hang on until he left town? She'd stink and kiss him, that's what she'd do, and she could not allow a kiss to happen. Clay brought her back to the conversation with, Man, if I could do what you do, I'd have a studio already. And you'd be so busy you'd never come home, she thought. Paisley bit her lip. If I had your ability to dream, who knows what I could accomplish. You have passion, said Clay. Paisley's shoulders dropped. Not really. I create moments for other people, I don't ever get to enjoy them myself because I'm always looking ahead. Does looking ahead make you happy? I guess. Clay hooked his finger under her chin and lifted her gaze. There's more to you than cookies, pious. Paisley pulled back and began organizing her desk. I just don't see it, she mumbled. Who made you forget? Clay's voice was as soft as a meadow just covered in snow. It was all there before I left. Something happened. Paisley blinked back the sudden onset of anger. Anger at herself for ever letting a stranger into her heart. I trusted someone I shouldn't have. I was fresh out of high school and it was stupid. Clay shook his head. No, he was stupid. Paisley felt the tug of a smile. Come on, who was he? We'll go toilet paper his house or something. Smiling, Paisley replied, he's not local. Oh. Clay nodded as though a puzzle piece fell into place. In that case, good riddance. What about you? Any broken hearts in California? Paisley held her breath. Clay leaned back. Nah, at first, I was too poor to date. When I was making money, I went out with a few girls, but my studio always called. I worked every chance I got. I was lousy boyfriend material. Well, their loss. Paisley flushed, but she was glad she'd said it when Clay caught her eye and held her gaze. He opened and closed his mouth like he was going to argue the point and then changed his mind. It's getting late. He saved the proposal and closed his laptop. Can I buy you dinner? It's the least I can do after keeping you here so long. Dinner with Clay was too risky. It's no trouble. I'm glad I could help. Besides, you already brought me chocolates. She tucked the box into her purse and shut down her computer. This was worth way more than just chocolate. You don't understand the depth of my addiction. They walked out to the receptionist's desk and Paisley breathed a sigh of relief when Susan wasn't at her station. Come on, I feel like celebrating, urged Clay. He put on his heavy coat and helped Paisley into hers, before tucking his stocking cap over his hair making his curls do that flip thing over the rim. Because her pulse doubled at the sight, Paisley knew she had to put some distance between them. The evening was fun. She truly enjoyed spending time with Clay. He had big dreams and had listened to what she said. However, the way he looked at her sometimes made her want to be more than just old friends, and she needed to keep her distance. Paisley pulled the hood up on her coat. I'm going to call it a night, but thanks for the invitation. Clay's hands disappeared into his coat pockets. Oh, I should probably check on my dad. Probably, Paisley agreed. I owe you one. He gave her a hopeful smile. Sure. As they approached, the glass doors slid open and freezing Montana air blasted Paisley in the face. The wind howled and she tucked her arms close to her body. 
Good luck with the loan, she yelled over the wind. Thanks, I'll let you know how the meeting goes. I'd like that. And, she realized, she would. Thoughts of Clay and his big dreams occupied her drive home. The studio would be amazing. He'd described the setup and Paisley could picture the space in her head. She missed being involved with the band. They had such energy and when they hit the music just right, they made magic. As she changed into her pajamas at home, she found herself humming an old iron stick song and imagining the way Clay looked now with a bass guitar in his hands. Chapter 5 The next night, Paisley bundled up and headed over to Sawyer's house so they could take the kids to the sing-along together. Her dad was flat on his back after another adjustment from the chiropractor and her mom need to stay home to care for him and make sure the chores got done. Paisley was sure things ran just as smoothly under her mother's watchful care, maybe more so, than they did when her dad was up and about. The sing-along was Amber's favorite Christmas tradition and Paisley couldn't blame her. Paisley liked to sing, she just didn't have Amber's talent. When the first few notes cracked over the speakers, Paisley would hold her breath, waiting for a myriad of voices to burst forth. Christmas carols should be sung out loud and joyfully. The sing-along was the perfect place to gather buckets of Christmas cheer. She also loved spending time with her nephew and niece. Peek was so cute last year when he sang, Frosty the Snowman. Only, he didn't say Frosty, he said Rosty. Adorable. Paisley parked on the curb and made her way through the chill to the front door of their modest home. Amber answered, wearing Santa pajamas, a matching scarf, and no makeup. Crap. I meant to call. Journey's got strep throat. We're going to have to cancel tonight. Paisley's excitement deflated like a Rudolph blow up lawn ornament. She'd wanted to see the kids. Can I come in? Amber stepped back. Enter at your own risk. She's been on antibiotics for a few days as a precaution, so she shouldn't be contagious. But, we could all be carrier monkeys. Paisley stepped out of the cold and into the front room, where she tripped over Sawyer's drum set. Sorry, things are kind of crammed in here. Amber kicked a few heavy wires out of the way. Paisley felt like she'd skipped back in time. Amps, music stands, and even the old soundboard, crowded in with the entertainment center and a recliner. Microphones rested on the fireplace mantel where the kids couldn't get to them. Clay's bass stand was empty in the corner, but his old amp was there. Bill's keyboard had scratches and the paint was chipped. The equipment looked shabbier than she remembered, but the underlying thrill was still there. Where's your couch? she asked. Amber pointed through the archway. In the dining room under the bay window. The tree? Amber usually set up their tree in the front room, right in the bay window. She loved to change the color scheme. Last year, she used bubblegum pink to celebrate Journey's first Christmas. Dining room. Paisley laughed. You guys are serious. Just until Christmas. Right, because Clay's leaving. Amber rambled on, it's been so great to get together again. I feel like I've found a part of my soul I didn't know was missing. Paisley ran her hand down Jeb's guitar strings and wondered what that would feel like. I sent Sawyer and Peek to the store for baby Tylenol. They should be back soon. Do you want to eat dinner with us? Sure. Amber was almost as passionate about cooking as she was about music. Paisley envied her flavorful dinners and when that girl went to work on chocolate, all diets flew out the window. They walked through the dining area and Paisley paused to admire the turquoise-themed Christmas decorations on the tree. Glass balls and stars in blue, accented with white snowflakes and bows hung from the branches, making them droop. Even the lights twinkled from white to turquoise. I think I like this one best, said Paisley. I thought the gold one was your favorite, said Amber as she lifted the lid off a pot and stirred the homemade chicken soup. Oh, that one was pretty. 
Paisley stepped closer and touched a tiny guitar ornament's smooth surface. She noticed drums and microphones sprinkled here and there. Amber was all about the moment. Do you think I'm spontaneous? Paisley blurted. Amber's spoon paused. Um, not really. Why? At least, Amber was honest with her. Paisley slumped onto a bar stool and rested her chin on her hand. It was just something someone said. Amber added pepper to the soup. This someone wouldn't happen to be Clay, would it? Maybe, Paisley said begrudgingly. Amber narrowed her eyes like a protective older sister. What did he say? Paisley ticked the items off on her fingers as she said that I forgot how to have fun. That I'm shut off to feeling things. That I'm boring. He called you boring. Amber knew the whole story with Brent, right down to the way he'd called her and Snow Valley as boring as a rodeo without any bulls. She was ready to work herself into a tizzy on Paisley's behalf and Paisley didn't want to be responsible for getting Clay on Amber's bad side. Not in so many words. Amber pressed her lips together. Why do you care what he thinks? I don't. Paisley spoke too fast. She tucked her hands under her legs and lowered her voice. It's just, everyone seems to be more passionate than me. You and Sawyer grab onto things like music, decorating for Christmas, even each other, and fill your life with them. I don't do that and I wonder if I'm missing out. Amber took the simmering soup off the stove and got out four bowls and spoons. If you don't like it, change it. I saw a movie once where the guy had to say yes to everything. The experience opened up a host of possibilities in his life. You could do that. Paisley chewed on the idea. All I have to do is say yes? Yes, to everything. Amber circled the table putting out the bowls and spoons. Paisley got clean cups from the dishwasher and followed her. Everything? Paisley wasn't sure. What if someone asks me to rob a bank or buy kids cigarettes? Amber cocked her hip. Seriously, do you even know someone who would ask you to rob a bank? Paisley went to the fridge to get out the milk and the grape juice she knew would be in there. Sawyer always drank milk with dinner and Peek preferred grape juice. No. But, you know what I mean. So, take a test drive. Do it tomorrow. Amber put a trivet in the middle of the table. She poured the soup into a Christmas tureen and then sliced up thick crusted bread. Paisley stopped in the middle of the kitchen, grape juice in one hand and milk in the other. Can I really do this? Amber walked around her. You're scared, aren't you? Paisley couldn't even answer, her mind was stuck like a scratched CD and she couldn't get past the idea stage. Saying yes to every possibility, every request, every opportunity would leave her day open, exposed. The idea made her feel bare, no vulnerable. Amber said, I dare you. Paisley dodged the hot pad Amber through her direction. Double dog dare you. Amber laughed and threw the other hot pad. Paisley stuck out her tongue. With Amber's ammunition spent, Paisley took a moment to reflect on the idea. She was terrified of the risk and pulled in by the unexpected. As far as experiments go, this one was somewhat controlled. All she had on her calendar tomorrow was food shopping and catching up on cheesy Christmas movies. She'd planned to go to the winter carnival with Amber and the kids because Sawyer had to work late, but if Journey was sick, they'd stay home, which meant she'd just have to survive a day alone. There was no chance of running into someone who, okay, there was no chance of running into Clay and having him tease her, ask her to dinner, or invite her to a food fight. Sure, she was being a chicken, but if one day went well she could extend the trial. I'll do it. Paisley placed the drinks on the table. Amber's eyes lit up and Paisley put her hands out in front of her. On one condition, I'm not talking to you or Sawyer all day. But. Nope. If you know I have to say yes, you can't take advantage of me. 
Sawyer will have me washing his car or sweeping the garage. Fine, but we have to bet. The stakes have to be high enough you won't chicken out. Paisley folded her arms. What do you have in mind? New Year's Eve babysitting. Fine. It's not like I have a date anyway. Although, after tomorrow, who knew? She could have three dates for New Year's. Yeah, right, there weren't three single men in Snow Valley. Okay, maybe there were, but she had no desire to date cousins or cousin-like friends. And, Amber got a wicked glint in her eye. You take down the outside Christmas lights in January. No way. If there was one chore Paisley hated more than scrubbing bathrooms, changing diapers, or cleaning out stalls, it was standing on an aluminum ladder in the cold, trying to unhook Christmas lights. Amber didn't leave her flair for the dramatic in the house. There had to be over two dozen strands blinking away out front. That's why you have a husband. Yeah, but I can't think of a better Christmas present to give him. What if I win? I'll do your hair and makeup for the ball and you can borrow any dress you want. It's a deal. Paisley held out her hand and they shook on it. Be prepared to hand over your black dress, girlfriend. I'll believe it when I see it, countered Amber. As Sawyer and Peek burst through the front door, Paisley realized tomorrow was a blank slate and for once in her life, she didn't have a dry erase marker ready to fill it in. Chapter 6 Paisley slept late Saturday morning for the first time since elementary school. Since the day was all about saying yes to opportunities and sleeping and was an opportunity she rarely indulged in, she thought she was off to a pretty good start. With a full eight hours of sleep, Paisley found a determination level she hadn't felt in quite some time. She was going to win this bet and earn a makeover from Amber if it killed her. Since she didn't have to go into work, the day would be a snap. She lay in bed reading for an hour before deciding she should at least get dressed. She turned on her laptop and opened her email, ready to say yes to whatever task lay before her. Her only email was a confirmation to pick up the tablecloths for the Christmas ball the day before Christmas Eve. Feeling discouraged, she sent an affirmative reply. She left yet another voicemail for Alfred concerning the string quartet. The situation was becoming desperate. If she had to, Paisley would drive to Billings and track the guy down. There was a knock at the door. Paisley peeked through the peephole to see her neighbor, Mrs. Brynolf, and her tall, gray bouffant. Unlocking the door, she swung it open with a hearty, good morning. Mrs. Brynolf took a step back, clutching her purse to her chest. Well, it won't be if my heart stops beating and I keel over just a few days before Christmas. Paisley suppressed a smile. Come now, Mrs. Brynolf, we both know you're much too sturdy to die of fright. Mrs. Brynolf relaxed her grip on her purse. I suppose it would take more than the likes of you to do me in. The morning passed quickly as she shared fruit cake with Mrs. Brynolf and helped load Christmas gifts into her car. Amber tried to call. Ha! <laughs> no way. Paisley sent her to voicemail. By the time lunch rolled around, Paisley felt daring and ordered takeout from Tina's. On the way home, she called Alfred again only to be greeted by his polite, but not at all helpful, voicemail. As she finished up with her message, her phone beeped. The caller ID flashed Amber's name and she ignored the call. Not a minute later Sawyer tried to call and she ignored him, too. Tapping her fingernails on the steering wheel, she wondered if there was an emergency. There were advantages to working at the hospital. When she got home, she logged into the system and checked the admittance list for her family's names. The, um, was slow. One set of stitches and the name attached wasn't familiar. She let out a sigh of relief. Her brother and sister-in-law thought they could test her mettle. The stinkers. Well, she'd show them. She turned off her cell phone and dropped it into her purse. The afternoon was pretty low-key. 
She did her grocery shopping, stocking up on enough food to last at least two weeks. She got home, unloaded her groceries, and settled in with a book. Around six, Paisley turned off her computer, fighting the disappointment that threatened to drag her down. Her big experiment had fizzled out. What did you expect to happen? Paisley contemplated her kitchen. Something, life-changing. She opened the fridge with a sigh. Time to make the lasagna she'd been putting off. Just like every other time she made a full pan, she'd divvy it out into plastic containers and freeze the pasta in individual serving sizes so she could pull them out for dinner later, in the week. The same old, same old routine grated on her nerves. Cold air from the freezer brushed her face. She was ready to throw her routine in the trash. The problem was, she didn't know what to do to shake things up. Filled with the same need to experience life that caused her to make the bet with Amber, she slammed the fridge shut and paced the kitchen, trying desperately to come up with a way to break through her boredom. The doorbell chimed. Paisley ran to open the door as though whatever was on the other side would be the answer to her dilemma. She was shocked to find Peek on her doorstep. Paisley dropped to her knees so they were eye to eye. Peek, how did you get here? You promised the whirly. What? Heavy footsteps echoed off the close-set buildings. A bulky form ran through the shadows and Paisley grabbed Peek's jacket to pull him inside. Peek, called a familiar, though near-panicked, voice. Paisley leaned out into the night air and could just make out Clay's stubble-covered jaw in the overhead lighting. Peek must have run ahead and scared Clay. Over here. She waved. Clay jogged in their direction, his breath trailing behind him in short puffs. Hey, he said giving her a huge smile as they all stepped inside and Clay shut the door behind them. Paisley leaned against the wall, because her legs turned to soup at the sight of Clay's eyes all alight. So? Not. Fair. Someone insisted we stop here, said Clay as he removed his stocking hat. He took off the minute I opened the door. I thought I'd lost him. And Pazwi. Peek stomped his Spider-Man snow boots in excitement. You have to come. Paisley looked from Clay to Peek. Where are you going, buddy? Whirly. Paisley had no idea what Peek wanted. She looked to Clay for translation. Amber said you promised to take him on the tilt-a-whirl. He pitched a fit when she said they couldn't go because the baby is sick. I offered to take him over to the carnival, but he won't go unless you go with him. Paisley's hand went to her chest. I forgot. They tried to call you, said Clay, his voice informational and not at all accusatory, though. Paisley had to swallow down the guilt. Amber had tried all day and Paisley had ignored her, ignored her nephew. What kind of an aunt was she anyway? My phone was off. So, you wanna head over? I hear it's going to be epic, Clay said with a hint of sarcasm. Paisley smiled. This was just what she'd been waiting for and still, she hesitated. Even though she was supposed to say yes, to everything, she wasn't expecting Clay to be the first real test to her commitment level. On the one hand, she should keep her promise to peak. On the other hand, she promised herself she would steer clear of Clay and his warm eyes. He was trouble with a postmark by December 25th label. But, there was her yes, bet with Amber. If she didn't go, Amber would win and Paisley would be forced to honor her word and take down their Christmas lights after New Year's. For a split second, she wondered if Amber arranged this to get her and Clay together, but one look at Peek's eager face blew that theory. The kid wanted so badly to ride the big rides last year, but didn't make the height requirement by less than one heartbreaking inch. She'd promised to take him all year and then things got so busy with the Christmas tree parade, the cookie party, and worrying about Journey's strep, she plum forgot the tilt-a-whirl. Forgetting her promise was no way to be the kid's favorite aunt. Bye! Bye! Lasagna Night Chapter 7 
The Winter Carnival was an anomaly in the world of carnivals. Where most cities and towns had their carnival in the summer when the only snow to be found was in a watermelon snow cone, Snow Valleys was in the middle of December. Sure, hot chocolate could turn into an ice cube at the top of the Ferris wheel and ski goggles were often required to get on the rides. Once word got out about their unconventional tradition, tourists thronged Snow Valley for the opportunity to ride a merry-go-round in a snowstorm. This year was no exception, except for the snowstorm part, and Paisley kept a tight hold to Peak's Mitten as Clay bought tickets. He offered, and since she was saying yes, she let him, even though the gesture made their outing too much like a date. He came back with two fists full of red and green tickets, his eyes alight. I want to do everything. Paisley laughed. Well, I think you bought enough tickets to do it all, and then some. Will you help me get these in here? He asked as he tried to wrangle one set of tickets into his coat pocket. With his gloves, the task was almost impossible. Paisley stepped close, trying not to notice the way her heart beat faster when Clay was around. Paisley used her teeth to pull off her right glove and stuff tickets into Clay's side pocket. He winked at her and she caught herself ducking her head. Dang. This was one of those times she focused on a task, so she could ignore her feelings. Not today. Today she had to open up and allow herself to experience life, even the way Clay made breathing difficult with just a look. She forced herself to catch Clay's eye. He seemed surprised at first, and then a lazy smile spread across his cheeks and Paisley decided one night flirting with Clay could be thoroughly enjoyable. She slipped her glove back on. I think I got it, she said, zipping up his pocket. You sure do, he said and Paisley forgot it was cold outside. I want tickets, too. Peek jumped up and down. Clay accordion folded a line of tickets and then held them up for Peek to see. These are the ones for your ride. We're gonna zip them in your pocket, so they don't get lost, okay? Okay. Peek held freeze tag still, so Clay could get the pocket zipped up. Paisley got a kick out of watching them together. As they walked through the entrance gates, the smell of roasted almonds filled the air. Paisley took a deep breath. I think Aunt Pazwe wants a snack. Clay steered them toward the food vendors. I'm. Go! Dash, Paisley stopped her knee-jerk reaction to put off her impulse. Instead, she swung Peek's arm and said, sounds great. Clay ordered two bags and handed over the required tickets. Laughing as they tried to grab the nuts with their huge gloves, they ended up tipping the cones back like cups. Can we play? asked Peek as he pointed at the game booths. The one right in front of them had different sized icicles. A couple players tried to toss multicolored hoops over the blunt spikes. Paisley shrugged. This one was an easy yes. Sure. They each got three hoops and took aim. Peek's first hoop bounced between two spikes and fell away. Paisley's hit the front spike and bounced to the floor. Clay's hooked one on a funny angle, did a lazy loop, and fell off. They all groaned. Clay tossed his remaining hoops and came up empty-handed. Peek missed both his shots and they watched Paisley as if she was their last hope for a stuffed snowman. Just throw a little harder this time, said Clay. Paisley took aim and threw the ring with more oomph. Once again, it hit the front icicle and bounced to the ground. Clay shrugged. Try throwing it like a frisbee. Okay. Paisley decided to give her all. She winged the hoop. As soon as she let go, she knew she'd thrown too hard. Her hands flew to her mouth as the hoop hit the booth operator in the back of the head, hard. He whipped around and pinned Clay in place with a glare. Sorry. Paisley held up both hands. So sorry. I didn't realize how hard I threw. Uh. Huh. The guy rubbed his head. He wasn't particularly big, but his eyes held a mean streak Paisley didn't want to test. We should go, she said. Yep. 
Clay took Peek's hand and stepped into foot traffic. Paisley hooked her hand in Peek's hoodie so she wouldn't get separated. She glanced behind her twice to make sure Mr. Mean Hoops wasn't following. They passed two booths and ducked to the side of the third. So, that was pretty much how I remembered carnival games, said Clay. Paisley laughed. You mean you always hit the guy in the head with the hoops? What kind of kid were you? Peek swung his head around to have a good view for Clay's answer. Clay wagged his finger at Paisley. No, he looked down at Peek. We don't throw things at people like Aunt Paisley. Right? Peek nodded once. Paisley looked at Peek. It was an accident. Sure. Sure. We believe you. Don't we, Peek? Clay asked, his sarcasm going right over Peek's head. Peek's eyes went back and forth between them like he was watching Wimbledon. He looked around, unsure what to say, and then pointed at another booth. I'm not sure we should let Aunt Paisley shoot penguins. Clay said to Peek, winking at Paisley. She could go in time out, suggested Peek. What? Paisley shook her head at her nephew. What if she promises to be good, asked Clay. Paisley harumphed. Peek didn't take time to contemplate the answer. His five-year-old attention span wanted to play the game more than he wanted to tease Paisley. Yeah, he pulled on Clay's hand and Paisley let go of his hood as they broke into a run. After just a moment, she ran to catch up. With the clear winter sky overhead, the smell of cinnamon and popcorn in the air, the carnival and Christmas lights glimmering, Paisley allowed herself to be caught up in Peek's enthusiasm and felt her inhibitions fly off her shoulders. She played all the games with as much enthusiasm as Peek and Clay and managed to not hurt anyone. After the game booths came the food vendors. Oh man, look at that, Clay pointed to one vendor who offered chocolate-dipped crickets. I don't think I could eat crickets, could you? Paisley swallowed. Though she held a deep and abiding love for chocolate, she'd never thought bugs could or would be involved. She shivered at the idea and tried to phrase her answer so she could still win her bet. I've never tried them before. You mean you'd try them, he asked, his face a mixture of awe and curiosity. Paisley cringed. Yes. This I have to see. Paisley's throat tightened as Clay walked up to the guy in the bright yellow coat to place an order. There wasn't a line. She laughed nervously. Why in the world would there be? Who eats bugs, chocolate or not? Peek's eyes were as big as the Ferris wheel as Clay passed the paper hot dog liner, brimming with chocolate-covered crickets, under his nose. What do you think, Peek? You want to give one a try? Noah Peek barely got the word out before he sealed his lips. They're all yours, Clay said, the awe evident on his face. Paisley took the basket and tried not to think about bugs. You know, in some countries, crickets are considered a delicacy, she said, taking in shallow breaths. Really? Clay folded his arms and leaned back. Stupid bet. Yeah, and covering them in chocolate should hide the taste, if there is one. She looked down at the basket and then back up again. Do crickets have a taste? Clay exchanged a look with Peek. I think it's more of a texture thing, replied Clay. Paisley nodded. Sure, like nuts in brownies or ice cream. This is no big deal. It's just like nuts in brownies she repeated in her head. She picked one up and held the dark blob in her palm. Thank goodness they weren't shaped like crickets. They're surprisingly light. Clay's eyes crinkled and Paisley had to give him credit for holding back a laugh. Okay, here goes. She popped one in her mouth and spit it right back out. She spit three times before Clay was able to hand her a napkin. She wiped the whole thing across her tongue while he laughed. Peek looked worried. You didn't even bite him, he said, looking down at the chocolate ball in the snow. Now, we'll never know if a cricket has a flavor.
Paisley spit into the napkin, cringing at the way Peek called the cricket him. I tried, buddy. You can tell your mom I tried. Clay pointed to the nearest garbage for Peek to throw the basket away. You okay? he asked Paisley. Yeah, I'm fine. She shuddered. He took her hand as if it were the easiest thing in the world. Let's get some cider, he motioned to another booth. You don't want to have bug breath. He gave her hand a gentle squeeze and Paisley stopped worrying about who was watching and started worrying over the funny feeling in her stomach. That had nothing to do with nearly consuming a chocolate-covered cricket. Sounds great. With warm cider cups clutched in their hands, Clay pulled her and peeked to the right. Fried pickles, now that I can recommend. The pickles were good and warm, which was nice because the temperature was constantly going down. They hung around a portable heater as they dipped their pickles in ranch dressing and savored the tangy flavor. Paisley watched Clay out of the corner of her eye. She'd been wondering for weeks what made him change and tonight was all about embracing opportunities so she plowed ahead. What made you change? Excuse me? Clay finished wiping ranch dressing off Peek's coat. Despite the chill, Paisley's cheeks burned. I mean, your hair and clothes. Why don't you wear all the black stuff anymore? Oh. Clay threw the napkin in the trash can as though he was shooting a basketball. His face was thoughtful as he contemplated his answer. Two points, said Peek around a mouthful. Clay smiled down at him and Peek turned his attention back to his snack. I played with a blues band for a few months. Nothing big, just a few gigs here and there, and the manager told me I needed to change up my look. I told him off for judging me, for trying to control me, and for acting like he was in charge of my life. He stood there and let me rant and when I was done, he put his arm around my shoulder and told me I was a child of God and he loved me. Clay shook his head. His words pierced me right to the heart. The feeling reminded me of sitting in the pew between my mom and dad and listening to Pastor John. All I wanted was to come home. He crumpled up his pickle wrapper. Why didn't you? I tried. I called my dad and asked him to send me money, but he was wiser than I gave him credit for at the time. He refused. He told me that every man needs to find his own way home. I thought about life a lot. God, my mom, and I figured out what I wanted. Once I had the idea for the studio, the rest just clicked into place. I was free to be me and I knew with God, I was enough. Paisley pressed her gloved hand to her chest. Clay's sincerity was overpowering. What's that? Peek asked, pointing at a man carrying a chio. Clay lifted one eyebrow. We can't go to a carnival and not have churros, he said. Though the moment had passed, Paisley's admiration for Clay grew. Not only had he struggled through a terrible loss at a young age, he'd found the Lord and opened his heart to grace. Pretty soon they all munched their way through the cinnamon and sugar treat. The smell reminded Paisley of Clay wrapping his arm around her at the cookie party, and she blushed. When Clay smiled at her as though they shared a secret, Usually careful about her diet, the evening's carnival-themed buffet had a strange effect on Paisley's system, making her feel sluggish. By the time they'd worked over the concession booths and made it to the rides, Paisley's stomach was so full all she wanted to do was curl up on a snow-sculpted bench and hibernate until spring. That wasn't going to happen with Peek around. She soldiered on with a smile on her face because she was having more fun with Clay than she'd had since well, since she could remember. After a few rides, Paisley got the impression Clay's determination to experience the carnival was more purposeful than just showing Peek a good time. When was the last time you came to the carnival, she asked. Clay sidestepped a clown in a Santa hat and said, the year my mom got sick. So, I guess I was twelve. Oh. Paisley pulled back on Peek's hood to keep him from getting run over by a group of overexcited teenagers, playing keep away with a stuffed reindeer. Clay stopped to count out enough tickets for them to ride the merry-go-round. 
he rubbed his fingers along the ticket's rough edge. Mom and I did this every year. Her last Christmas, she was too worn out to bring me, but Dad said he'd fill in. It wasn't the same and I... I realized she wasn't going to get better. Paisley put her hand on Clay's arm and stepped closer. I'm sorry. Clay brushed her hair over her shoulder and hooked his arm around her back. His brown eyes soaked her in and Paisley happily let them, for once not trying to analyze the situation or plan the next step. Thanks for coming. I wanted to do this, for mom. He paused. I thought coming here would be hard, but it hasn't been and. He searched her face, glancing at her lips. Paisley waited, feeling as though she could float to the top of the Ferris wheel. It's because you ate a bug. Clay. Paisley pushed him away as he laughed, letting her go. Are you ever serious? I try not to be. Life's too short, Pais. He waved a bouquet of tickets before her. Do you want to play? Paisley didn't hesitate. If she could eat a bug, okay, attempt to eat a bug, she could handle anything Clay, Peak, or the carnival, threw her way. Clay still had plenty of tickets and Paisley now saw them as tickets to freedom. Freedom from having to plan three steps ahead. Freedom from having to work over a decision until she saw all possible outcomes. Freedom from having to be responsible for everyone else's happiness. She didn't even count out the tickets to make sure there would be enough. This whole experiment gave her the chance to play like a kid and she loved it. Despite her newfound freedom, her overfull stomach gave her pause at the entrance to the merry-go-round. The ride turned out to be easy on her equilibrium, even though they went in circles. The Ferris wheel was cold, but manageable. Peak still wasn't tall enough for the scrambler so they had to pass. She was so going to win this bet. Clay held her hand between rides. Paisley knew the impression they gave that she and Clay were a couple and Peak was their little boy. It wasn't a bad picture. The idea sent a thrill up her arms as if the ghost of Christmas future nudged her. Whirly. Peak pointed to the spinning vortex of lights. Are you ready for this? asked Clay. As ready as I'll ever be, said Paisley. Paisley made a show of backing Peak up against the elf holding a measuring stick. He came in a full two inches over the elf's hat. He and Clay fist bumped. With his lips pressed together, Peak unzipped his pocket and pulled out the tickets reserved for his special ride. Before she knew it, the three of them settled into a cart and the safety bar pressed through her heavy coat and into her hips. The Beach Boys' little Saint Nick piped through the speakers, along with a bunch of static, and they started to spin. Peak squealed as they picked up speed. Around and around they went in tiny circles and the whole ride went up and down and in a circle. It was tilty. It was whirly. It was all that she'd promised Peak all year long, and it gave her a headache. When the ride came to an end, Clay pointed to the line. I think we could get on again. Do you want to? Paisley checked in with her stomach. It held steady and her head would settle down as soon as the ground stopped moving. One more ride wouldn't hurt. Clay was right about the line and they were spinning and twirling again in no time. Halfway through the ride, Paisley had a hard time focusing on things as they spun past. She soon felt the ride go one way and her stomach go the other. Closing her eyes, she concentrated on not thinking about the food she had eaten and breathing in through her nose, her mouth locked. Again. Again. Peak, holding Paisley with one hand and Clay with the other, ran off the tilt -o whirl and got back in the appallingly short line. Paisley pressed her cold glove against her flushed cheek. She couldn't remember ever doing something fun until she felt sick, ever. She felt like she was going to lose her snacks, lunch, and anything else she'd eaten all the way back to yesterday's breakfast. She groaned. Winning a bet took sacrifice and she was just going to have to suck it up. Besides, she was on a natural high from giving up all her worries and she didn't want to get off, even if the ground lifted and dropped like a wave. 
Clay eyed her with concern. I think we should give Aunt Paisley a break. He took her elbow and tugged her over to a bench. She sank down and put her head between her knees. What's wrong? asked Peek as Paisley rolled to the side and lay on the bench, humiliated to be brought down by a carnival ride. Lying on a bench in the middle of the carnival is better than throwing up in front of Clay. Thanks to the bug thing, he had enough ammunition to tease her for eternity. He squatted down in front of Peek and they were all on the same level. I think Aunt Paisley feels sick. Peek's eyes got wide. Are you going to throw up? I might, Paisley admitted. She scraped up a handful of snow and pressed it to her neck, sucking in at the sudden cold. You're gonna have a baby. Peek clapped his hands. What? Paisley jerked up and immediately regretted the movement. She dropped her head between her knees and focused on sucking air while she listened to Peek explain things to Clay. When grown-up girls need to throw up, it means they're gonna have a baby. Paisley couldn't lift her head to contradict the kid. She hoped Clay had more sense than to believe the four-year-old who didn't get the point of bumper cars. Peek kept talking, my mom threw up lots when sister was in her tummy cause there wasn't enough room for a baby and food in there. Aunt Paswi ate lots of food tonight and so the baby feels squished. Clay snorted and Paisley risked a look. Kneeling before Peek, the guy gallantly held back his laughter. He kept turning his head away to hide his smile from a kid who was as earnest as the day he'd sat on Santa's lap to make his Christmas request. Paisley slowly sat up straight and smiled, although she could tell it was a weak smile. Clay raised both his eyebrows and Paisley forced herself to speak up. Peek, honey. I'm not going to have a baby. But you said you were going to throw up. I think the ride made me sick. But you never throw up, just like mommy. I know, sweetie, but I'm sure I'm not going to have a baby. She kept her eyes on the kid, mortified to have this conversation in front of Clay. Yes, you are. Peek stomped one Spider-Man boot. Paisley didn't have the energy right at that moment to haul him off the tantrum sleigh and she cringed at the defiant look in his eye. Clay met her pleading gaze. He nudged Peek's shoulder. See the sign up there? The one that says you can't ride the ride if you are too short? Yeah, it also says you can't ride the ride if you're going to have a baby. If Paisley was going to have a baby, they wouldn't have let her on. Peek considered the new piece of information and Paisley considered the fact that some random sign at the carnival held more sway with her nephew than she did. Peek didn't outright agree with Clay, and Paisley got the uneasy feeling he was silently agreeing to disagree. Does this mean we have to go home? He looked ready to bolt if they tried to haul him out of the carnival before they turned off the lights. If Paisley answered, she'd have to say yes, so she held her tongue. Clay took Peek's hand. Why don't we go on a ride and Paisley can rest? We'll see how she feels when we get back. He caught and held Paisley's gaze. If she's still sick, we'll take her home, his voice went low, and tuck her in bed. Dang. Paisley's cheeks had just cooled down and then Clay had to go and say that. Thank you, she mouthed. Clay patted her knee and got to his feet. He leaned over and whispered, for the record, you'd make beautiful babies. The boys scampered off together while Paisley worked to pick her jaw up off the ground. She didn't know how he had the gumption to tease her about having babies. His comment was inappropriate and adorable at the same time. Paisley stretched out on her back with her knees up over the armrest of the bench and her legs dangling. Sure she'd had a great time, but she was so miserable. She stared up at the cloudless night sky and thought she might just kill Amber. Ripping off her gloves, she fumbled for her phone, turned it on, ignored the messages, and dialed. I give up, she said when Amber answered. Paisley? Amber kept her voice low. Either Paisley had woken her up or Journey slept close by. Yeah, it's me. I quit the bet. Why? Paisley threw her arm over her eyes. 
You don't want to know. Where are you? Amber asked. Right now, I'm lying on a bench at the carnival trying not to throw up. Amber snickered. I'm serious. The only thing this bet has gotten me is a new fear of crickets, a ding in my chocolate addiction, a sick stomach, a nephew who thinks I'm pregnant, and a booth operator who might sue me for a head injury. Amber had a hard time breathing through her laughter. Stop. You've got to stop. Paisley could picture her dabbing at the corner of her eyes, her shoulders shaking as she tried not to wake the baby. Paisley let her have her giggle fit before saying, So, you're going to be a wonderful, kind, sister-in-law and let me off the hook, right? I won't even ask for a Christmas present this year. Um, that would be a negatory. You've got until midnight, soldier. You're mean. You'll thank me later. Yeah, I probably won't. You love me, Amber said instead of, goodbye, and Paisley didn't try to argue. She shoved her phone back in her pocket and replaced her gloves. The cold started to seep in. Paisley took the change in temperature as a good sign and sat up. The world stayed put, instead of spinning in all directions, and she thought she might be able to stand, but stayed in her seat. Her enthusiasm drained, Paisley waited for Peak and Clay with her head hung low. If she survived the night, she'd never say yes again. A few minutes later, Clay slid into the seat next to her, Peak sleeping like an angel in his arms. His heavy lashes rested on his cheeks. Oh, some girl would fall head over heels for those lashes one day and never look back. Paisley shook her head. How did this happen? she asked softly. Clay shifted Peek's foot so it wasn't digging into his side. One minute he's bounding into the swings over there, and the next his head is bobbing. I had to grab onto his seat and keep him talking till the ride stopped and then he just conked out. Paisley patted Peek's back. I feel young when I can wear him out because more often than not, it's the other way around. She and Clay exchanged a look full of contentment. I can't imagine anyone wearing you out. You go non-stop. Clay put his free arm across the back of the bench, inviting Paisley to snuggle closer. She took the invitation. Being with him like this was natural and easy. She had to wonder if she would have done the same thing if not for Amber's double dog dare. Probably not. Guilt nagged. There was no rule against Paisley telling Clay about the bet and she felt he should know the truth. There's something I should tell you. She sat up straight. This dash, she made a circle with her finger indicating the carnival and herself, isn't me. Clay's eyebrows came together. Paisley pushed on. I made a bet with Amber that, for one day I had to say yes, to everything. She played with her scarf. Normally, I would watch other people play the games while I kept track of tickets. I don't eat churros or pickles or other fried foods and I would never even consider trying crickets, chocolate or otherwise. Clay's hand found her shoulder and eased her back into the seat. Why would you make a bet like that? Paisley continued to twist her scarf around her hands. The people in my life are so enthusiastic about, well, about life. They aren't boring or predictable. I wanted to try it out. You know, see what I was missing. Clay glanced down at her fidgeting hands. What about me, was I part of the bet, too? No. It was a coincidence we ended up here together. A happy coincidence or just a coincidence? Paisley hadn't considered the question. I'd have to say a happy one. You made the night much more enjoyable and slightly more embarrassing. Clay pointed to himself, me? Embarrassing? You're the one spitting things and turning green. Paisley elbowed him lightly in the gut. Yes, but I had to do it all in front of you. Clay used the arm resting behind her to gather her close. Peak occupied Clay's left side, counting sugar plums, oblivious to the energy encircling their bench. Paisley rested her hand on Clay's chest, 
just like she had at the cookie party. This time, there was no part of her desiring to keep him away. So, Clay's lazy smile made Paisley's heart skip a beat. If I asked to kiss you, you'd have to say yes? Paisley gasped as a shot of panic raced through her veins. Before she could even think about Clay leaving after Christmas or the way her heart could become collateral damage, she said, technically, you wouldn't have to ask. I just want to make sure I have it all straight, technically, he said before his lips found hers. Paisley melted against him. She couldn't help herself, kissing Clay was like sitting next to a warm fire and riding the scrambler all at the same time. His tenderness had her trembling inside her thermal insulated coat. When they broke apart, Paisley didn't dare open her eyes. She'd been here before. Well, not here on this bench, but in the moment after a first kiss, when she hoped this guy might be more than just another guy. Last time she was here, she opened her eyes to a self-satisfied look staring back at her. She didn't want to spoil the perfect feeling, this in-between moment full of happy possibilities. Clay brushed his cheek against hers. Pace, he whispered near her ear. Hmm. I have a problem. Paisley pulled back and opened her eyes to find Clay shining. He didn't look like a man with a problem, he looked like a man who was happy and content. I don't know if you kissed me because you wanted to, or if you kissed me to beat Amber at her game. He brushed her hair over her shoulder. What an impossible situation, all because of that stupid double dog dare. Paisley's shoulders dropped. I don't think it will help much if I told you it was both. He shook his head. Nope. You're still under the influence of the bet. Paisley bit her lip. What do you suggest? I think I should find you first thing in the morning and kiss you again. Then, I'd know for sure. Paisley grinned. He wasn't stealing kisses and running away. That could work. Clay stood up and offered his hand. All right. Let's get going. Where? Paisley took his hand and once she was steady on her feet, he didn't let go. It's like my mom used to say on Christmas Eve, the sooner we get to sleep the sooner we can wake up. Paisley laughed as he hurried them through the thinning crowds, the in-between, happy feeling carrying her along. Chapter 8 The memory of Clay's kiss stopped her halfway through brushing her teeth just to grin at herself in the mirror. Paisley put on her pajamas and climbed into bed. She replayed the night, well not the cricket part, over and over again. When the clock struck midnight, a spell broke and all the things Paisley had been able to forget while wrapped up in clay, came flooding back. The intensity of her feelings for clay overwhelmed her. The kiss was incredible and she was falling for clay like a ten-pound lure dropped into a three-foot stream. She buried her head beneath the pillow and opened her mouth in a silent scream. Gasping for air, she threw the pillow off her face and onto the floor. She couldn't fall in love with Clay. What would they do when he left, see each other on weekends? Visit during the holidays? Spend hours on the phone wishing they weren't so far apart? There was no telling how long a relationship built on cell phone coverage could last. Besides, long-distance relationships didn't often end in a marriage and a couple of beautiful children. They broke off. Broken hurt. Snagging the pillow and giving it a good hard fluff, Paisley settled back under the thick blankets. Even now, hours later, Clay's kiss still tingled against her lips. A few more kisses from Clay and she'd completely lose her mind. Losing her mind was unacceptable. If she let loose, the whole world would erupt into chaos. Okay, maybe not the whole world, she was too practical to be that dramatic, but her corner of the world would become unfamiliar and, and, scary. Nope, she needed to brush off the kiss and move on. The only problem, okay, the biggest problem, was that Clay would be there in less than eight hours expecting a repeat performance. Oh, how Paisley wanted to participate. Since the first moment she laid eyes on the real clay at the bonfire, she'd wanted to wrap her arms around his neck, 
bury her fingers into his curly locks, and never let go. Hugging the pillow close, she finally fell into a deep sleep. In the bright light of day, the confusion holding Paisley captive after midnight faded like a bad dream. She stepped into the shower knowing full well she was too smart to fall for another guy who would pull a disappearing act. She simply wouldn't allow it. Her new resolve didn't mean she had to swear off Clay. They could have a good time while he was in town. As long as she knew what they shared was going to end, and he was aware the arrangement was temporary, there wasn't any harm in sharing time and lip-tingling kisses while he was here. She'd just have to keep a firm hold on her emotions. No falling in love. Her plan was a good one. However, she did see a hole. A hole that set her all aflutter. Her inhibitions evaporated when Clay was around. She trusted him enough to say what she was feeling, tease, and laugh, even at herself. She wasn't afraid to do something stupid, like try to eat a cricket. With him around, she felt brave. He brought out a part of her personality she'd hesitated to explore. Granted, it wasn't the smartest side of her. Clay helped her find a level of reckless abandon that made life interesting. Paisley slipped into a skirt and button-up blouse borrowed from Amber, looking forward to Clay picking her up for church. She went to the kitchen to grab a bowl of cereal when there was a knock at the door. Smoothing her hair with her hand, Paisley hurried to answer it. Sawyer, dressed in a suit and tie bustled in. Man, it is cold out there this morning. He shook like a dog, throwing snowflakes at all angles. Mornin' a dot. Good morning. Paisley stifled her irritation at having her brother show up uninvited when Clay would be there any minute. She grabbed a bowl and spoon. What's up? Journey and Peak are still out so Amber's sleeping in. They're going to stay home. Journey's not supposed to go out yet, so I came by myself. Paisley added milk to her bowl and took a bite. Sawyer checked his phone. We have to leave in ten minutes. Paisley shook her head, her mouth full of wheat. She finished chewing and said, Thanks for thinking of me, but I have a ride. Sawyer sat down at her bar and threw back a handful of dry cereal. Clay called. He said he had a conference call and asked if I could drive you. Paisley focused on her cereal, which now looked as appetizing as a basket of crickets. Oh. He didn't even have the decency to call her cell. Instead, he called her big brother to give her a ride. That's not humiliating. Five minutes, he said as she hurried from the room. Paisley grabbed her sensible church shoes and her purse. You ready? Sawyer called from the front room. Yeah, Paisley slipped into her coat and followed him out to the parking lot. She got in his car, still warm from the ride over, and stared out the window as they made their way through town. She'd officially been brushed off, without even a phone call. She rubbed her temples. You tired? You're awfully quiet, Sawyer asked. I'm fine. We're jamming tomorrow night if you want to come over. No, thank you. Paisley didn't offer an excuse. Though Sawyer didn't take offense to her cold shoulder, he also didn't ask for an explanation. He just shrugged and turned up the music. That was one advantage to having Sawyer around, he was such a guy, although he wasn't the guy Paisley wanted to ride to church with, he wouldn't pry into her personal life. She spent the remainder of the ride berating herself for giving Clay an inch, because he'd gone and taken a mile and she hadn't even seen it coming. She kept her cool until Sawyer pulled into the church parking lot. Storming through the double doors, Paisley spotted her parents sitting in their usual pew and made her way over. The church was filled with locals and out-of-towners. Her parents always made an effort to arrive early in order to get their regular seat. With the number of tourists in town, it was a good thing, seats filled up fast. Besides the unfamiliar faces, a few long-lost friends came home for the holidays. Caslin was hard to miss sitting next to the tallest man in the congregation. Paisley felt a pang as she realized how far they drifted apart. 
but she was happy for Caslin, bringing a guy home was a big step. Paisley's mom gave her a look for cutting it close, but didn't have time to ask any questions as Pastor John was already at the pulpit. He introduced his nephew, who was a pastor in training. Paisley lifted her eyes off the hymnal long enough to note the man didn't resemble a pastor much before dropping them again. Paisley adjusted her skirt and glared at her hands. Her chest ached, reminding her of when Brent left. One day she was flying high on what she thought was love, and the next she came crashing down as his shiny blue pickup truck hauled tail out of town without so much as a, see you next year. Brent played her, hard, and she walked right into his game, innocent of the rules. His abrupt and cold departure left her angry, hurt, and a whole lot wiser. Wiser? Ha! She yanked on her shirt cuffs, determined to pay more attention to the sermon than she did to Clay. Sure, she coped, or shut off as Clay would say, but it was the only way she knew how to get through the day. She had to keep it together through church and the invariable socializing after. Then Sawyer could drive her home and she could disappear into a cheesy Christmas movie and a bucket of popcorn. She pulled her phone from her purse, ignored her mother's scowl, and checked her missed calls list. Crap. Alfred's number was listed several times over the last two days. She fidgeted in her chair, not unaware of the people around her scooting away so she wouldn't bug them. She was antsy to get outside and check her messages. When the sermon was over, she excused herself, climbed over Sawyer's long legs, and darted for the ladies' room to check her voicemail. Alfred hadn't left a message, which frustrated her to no end considering the number of times she'd tried to call him in the last week. The least he could have done was leave her some sort of affirmation the quartet would be there on Christmas. Instead, she was left wondering. Wondering left a pile of rocks in her stomach. She stuffed her phone in her purse and ran out just as several teenage girls ducked into the restroom. She found Sawyer across the room and motioned for him to meet her outside. Where are you off to in such a hurry? Dad snagged her waist in one of his vice grip one-armed hugs and Paisley struggled to breathe. He let go just as fast as he'd grabbed on. Dad wasn't much for public displays of affection. I've got a phone call to make for work. Are you coming for dinner? Your mom made rolls. Paisley pressed her hand against her stomach. After all the fried food she'd eaten last night, the last thing she needed was a pot roast and homemade rolls. Besides, her parents would want to discuss the band and Clay. She needed to put some distance between them. Maybe next week. I'm under the gun. She pecked a kiss on his cheek before darting off to meet Sawyer in the parking lot. She had just walked through her front door when her phone rang. Paisley scrambled to get it out of her purse, praying it was Alfred. She'd finally be able to confirm the band and put the cherry on top of the Christmas ball arrangements. It was. Alfred. So good to hear from you. Thanks, Miss Hackett. How are things going? Not so great. He paused to pull the phone away and cough. I'm sorry to tell you, but half the group has strep. Paisley felt the floor give way and she grabbed onto the edge of her counter. Oh no. Jared's face has swollen and he's in the hospital. He'll be lucky to make it home for Christmas, let alone play. I'm sorry, but we'll have to cancel. Paisley used her free hand to rub her temple. It's kind of late notice. I tried to call your cell last night, but it went straight to voicemail. Paisley gritted her teeth. One more reason she should have stayed put in her role as the responsible one instead of frolicking around the carnival like a child. The ball is less than a week away. I understand and I'll be happy to refund your deposit. I am sorry. Tipping her head up, Paisley begged the heavens for a Christmas miracle. It's not your fault they're sick. I hope they get better soon. Thank you. I'll put the check in the mail in the morning. All right. Well, thank you. Happy holidays. You, too. 
Paisley hung up the phone and almost threw it at the wall. Instead of giving in to the tantrum, she buckled down and got to work. She had options. At least, she did several months ago. She spent the next couple hours making contact with each group or band on her list and getting rejected right and left. If they did play on Christmas, which not all of them did, they were already booked. Paisley buried her face in her hands. This was not happening. She crumpled up the paper she'd been using to take notes. She shouldn't have taken the bet. Letting loose wasn't worth the havoc hangover. Losing the band had to be punishment for throwing caution to the wind Saturday night at the carnival. She was so worried about the ball, it didn't occur to her Clay hadn't called until she flopped onto her pillow. Exhausted from pacing the floor and leaving messages with random people listed on the web who may or may not be able to help, Paisley fell into a restless sleep. Chapter 9 Paisley viciously ripped up a sheet of paper and growled as she stuffed it in the garbage can. Tom breezed into her cubicle and stopped short. Trouble, he asked. Paisley swallowed. She'd hoped to tell Tom there'd been a change in bands, not that there wasn't one. The band cancelled. They've got strep. She crumpled two more papers into a ball and aimed for the trash. I've called every group within a two-hour drive. They're all booked. Tom snapped his fingers a couple of times. What about the band Clay mentioned at the cookie party? Paisley's jaw dropped. The iron sticks? You've got to be kidding? Tom shrugged. Beggars can't be choosers. Paisley wanted to cry. She stared at the papers filled with painstaking details for the ball scattered over her desk. All her work to create an evening of elegance and gentile dignity, for nothing. Tom tapped his finger twice on her desk bringing her attention back to him. You'd better book them before someone else does. Paisley snorted. Like anyone was going to book the iron sticks for a Christmas party. We need live music, Paisley. It's the icing on the cake. He was right. The main draw for the event was a quartet, orchestra, or band to lift the evening from small town to spectacular. I'm not sure the iron sticks will bring the right feeling. Paisley sat up and arranged the scattered papers. Clay said they did old time Christmas. He rubbed his chin. Rock and roll Christmas, that was the theme. But, all the decorations are for an elegant dash. Tom cut her off. We'll have to adjust. Paisley tried once more to save the ball she'd. Pictured along with her pride. It would have been one thing to eat crow and ask Clay to play at the ball if things were peachy between them, but, with the huge, uncomfortable chasm they faced, because he kissed her, promised to see her, and then dogged her. Approaching him would be humiliation galore. There was no way around working with Clay either. Since Amber hadn't said a word about the possible gig, Paisley knew Clay worked the deal on his own. What about the money, she asked. Clay said they'd perform for free, so we can take the money we would have used on the band to buy new decorations which would mean Paisley would have to brave the holiday shoppers and traffic and billings tomorrow. Ugh. She hated strep throat with a passion and she didn't even have it. She tapped her pen against the desk. We can still use the fake trees and lights. I bet there's some fun guitars and musical notes I could find, said Paisley thinking of Amber's tree. The cupcake display will need edible glitter and we should switch to punch cups instead of champagne flutes for the cider. Tom leaned against the wall. You're on the right track. We just need the band. Do you have Clay's number? Paisley started. No, which meant he didn't have hers. She hadn't even thought of that. Maybe he had wanted to call her. She shook out her hands as if she could shake off the negativity that followed her throughout the night. I know how to reach him. She checked the clock. She had plenty of time to get over to Sawyer's, the band would be there for a few more hours. Her hands flitted across her desk. 
suddenly overwhelmed with a desire to see the iron sticks they were going to be thrilled about performing, Paisley stood up and threw her coat on. I'll text you if there's a problem. Thanks. Tom went back to his office. Paisley bolted for the door, then had to turn around and go back for her purse. She found her keys and slid behind the wheel. Please start, she begged the motor. Her car wasn't that old, but sitting in a parking lot in the cold Montana winter could kill a battery. The engine fired up on the first try. Yes. Never had the drive to her brother's house taken so long. She parked across the street and left the motor running as she worked up her courage to beg them for a favor. Sawyer's drums sounded over the front lawn and filtered into her car. She counted trucks. They were all there, even Clay. Here goes nothing, she mumbled as she climbed out. Halfway up the walk, Sawyer sounded off a one to two beat and then the band broke into Run, Run Rudolph. Paisley paused on the porch to listen. They were actually good. Way better than their high school counterparts. She knocked on the door, but the music was so loud no one heard. She sucked in a lungful of cold air and courage and opened the door. Sawyer, with his drums next to the door, was the only one who noticed her arrival. He tipped his chin in her direction, but didn't lose the beat. Amber sang to the fireplace, her hips bopping to the beat. The whole room pulsed with energy and Paisley closed her eyes just to feel it. The bass drum reverberated in her chest like a second heartbeat. Amber's voice, deeper now and with a bluesy quality she didn't have before, slid over her skin. Bill's lead guitar and Jeb's keyboard made her bob her head. Clay's bass guitar filled her from her toes to the top of her head with melted chocolate. Her eyes flew open. She knew what she'd been missing all these years. It wasn't a lackluster passion for life or spontaneity, it was being a part of the Iron Sticks. She wanted to cry and laugh at the same time. She dropped her coat by the door and stepped behind Sawyer to the soundboard. She adjusted the mic balance and toned down the keyboard for an overall rounder effect to complement blues element Clay created in his rift. She didn't think anyone would notice, but Clay's head jerked around the second his sound changed. When he saw her, he grinned as bright as the Griswold's Christmas light display. Winking, he turned back around to finish the verse with Amber. Paisley kept her head down until the last note, anticipating changes in the lead and accommodating them. They finished with a crash of cymbals and Paisley couldn't stop smiling. This was where she felt the most alive. Looky what the cat dragged in, said Bill. It's good to see you, too. Paisley came around and accepted hugs from Bill and Jeb. I thought you weren't coming, Sawyer tapped his sticks against his legs. Paisley had forgotten his habit. Did you bring cookies? asked Jeb. Paisley pressed her lips together. Sorry, no cookies. Actually, she cleared her throat, it was now or never. No sense beating around the bush. I wondered if you all would like to perform at the Christmas ball. Amber let out a squeal. Are you kidding? I'm serious. Our quartet cancelled. She lifted her shoulders. The gig is yours, if you want it. An ear-piercing screech filled the air. Everyone ran to their speakers, but Paisley knew that sound. She clambered through music stands to get to Clay's amp where she twisted the right dial and the noise died away. I think they heard that clear down at Larson's. Bill opened and closed his mouth like he was trying to pop his ears. It's a good thing the kids are at your mom's. Sawyer smiled at Amber. Clay skimmed his fingers up Paisley's arm. What happened to elegant and refined, he asked. The excitement in his eyes was hard to misinterpret. He wanted to perform. Paisley couldn't blame him. She'd had a taste, a nibble, of being a part of the music again and it meant more to her than anything she'd done since Clay left town and the Iron Sticks disbanded. His gaze went deeper and he took Paisley's hand, here, in front of the band. His openness told her more than Clay could have said if he spoke for a year straight. 
He wasn't playing her and their kiss meant just as much to him as it did to her. Things changed, Paisley said quietly. Hey, Clay said all low and rumbly-like, making Paisley's stomach do flip-flops. I'm sorry about yesterday. I had a call from an investor and things snowballed from there. I haven't had a chance to breathe. His brown eyes twinkled. And, I didn't get your number. It wasn't a big deal. It was at the time, she silently admitted, but it wasn't now. Clay ran his hand through his hair and Paisley bit her lip. He must have sensed the distance she'd spent two days putting between them, because he continued to explain. I didn't figure in the time difference when I made plans to come get you. If my phone alarm hadn't gone off, I would have missed the call. Did you get the loan? Paisley asked, hoping to keep the focus on the studio and off of them. I don't know yet. But, things went well. We should know in the next couple of days. We? Paisley squeaked. So much for not talking about them. Yeah, Clay leaned forward. I thought you were invested, he said as she dropped his hand. Oh, right. Paisley's heart sank. Clay wanted this studio, wanted it enough he'd scrimped for years to achieve his goal. She'd seen the paperwork, heard the intoxication in his voice, and understood his commitment to his dream. No matter how much she cared for him, she had to let him go, had to let him make this idea a success. After sharing in the magic tonight, even for one song, she understood what made Clay leave town in the first place. She couldn't take his plans from him and feel good inside. Clay stepped forward and touched her waist. Paisley wanted nothing more than to slide into his arms and celebrate their gig. Coming together was so easy when he touched her. But, it wasn't about what she wanted. She couldn't leave Snow Valley and Clay couldn't stay. No matter how much they wanted to be together, it would have to end one way or another. Paisley pushed away from the amp and moved behind his music stand, out of his reach. If she was going to let him go, there could be no more kisses that made her tremble, no more quiet moments together, no more possibilities. Clay furrowed his brow, but didn't follow after her. So, sound check, three o'clock on Christmas? Paisley called out as she picked up her coat. We'll be there. Amber replied. You're not leaving, are you? We need you on the board. Jeb took a swig from his soda. Some things never change. Paisley chanced a quick look at Clay who held his guitar as if it could protect him from harm. Maybe it was in a way. Paisley couldn't follow him out of Snow Valley. This was home, the place she wanted to raise her children, and his road was leaving town. Sorry, guys. I have a ton to get done before the ball. Rock and roll doesn't just happen. She ducked out the door to a chorus of goodbyes and settled in the front seat before the tears spilled down her cheeks. Chapter 10 Before heading out to Billings to shop for rock and roll themed decorations, Paisley sent out a mass email letting attendees know the change in the theme for the Christmas ball. Some attendees would be put out, but the first three replies were positive. Paisley didn't check her email as she drove, but when she parked the car, she had a couple people to call and appease. Killing two birds with one stone, she made her way into the party supply store and dialed Mrs. Bergen. It took a few minutes to find the right aisle, but once there, Paisley felt blessed the place was stocked well. You can still wear the black dress, Mrs. Bergen. I'm sure you will look stunning. It just won't be right. I'll look ridiculous in velvet. Mrs. Bergen, you've never looked ridiculous in your life. I've always admired the way you put yourself together, said Paisley as she put several boxes of miniature guitar ornaments in her cart. Thank you, dear, but I'm going to go out right now and find something more appropriate. I'll see you Christmas night. Yes, dear. Paisley added no less than 30 vinyl record decorations to her cart before dialing the next number. She continued to multitask, making phone calls and shopping right alongside the last-minute holiday shoppers. 
Soon, she had enough decorations to fill her trunk and the back seat, a punch bowl, and coordinating paper goods. The last thing on her list was skinny ties for the guys in the band to wear. Amber had texted her that morning asking her to pick some up. Color didn't matter, in fact, the uglier the better. Paisley found the ties at a small boutique on 2nd Avenue. The vintage dress and ornaments window display caught her eye. After some crafty maneuvering, she parked right out front. A spunky salesgirl and the smell of cinnamon greeted Paisley at the door. Well, if that's not a sign. She made her way to the Iron Tree tie rack display. Ties in all shapes and colors hung from the branches. Separated out by decade, Paisley found the 50s branch and dug through the selection with gusto. She picked a green checked one for Bill and a bright blue and orange striped bow tie for Jeb because she knew he would hate it. For Sawyer, she chose black with the silhouette of a dog because the puppy made her smile. Clay was much harder. She wanted something to reflect his style, as well as her faith in his abilities, a nice, goodbye, gift that would signify their short time together. In the end, she picked a solid red one that shone in the light. She ran the satin material through her fingers and realized with a start that it was the same color he'd complimented on her. The memory of Clay's kiss washed over her, filling her with a sense of being cherished she'd never felt before. She pictured the two of them snuggled up on her couch watching a movie and ached for those quiet moments that, strung together like popcorn on a Christmas tree, make up a life together. Her text alert beeped, breaking her trance and reminding her she didn't have time to stand around daydreaming about a man she couldn't have. Amber, we need to know how many outlets are available in the city building. Paisley typed her reply and kept the phone in her hand as she browsed the store for decorations. Amber would look stunning in any of the 1950s dresses on display. She clicked a picture of one and sent it off. Amber's reply wasn't long in coming. Amber, THX, but I'm all set. Do you still want to borrow my dress? You earned it. Paisley wasn't surprised Amber had something appropriate to wear. That girl had a closet to envy. She put off answering the text. The shop had a beautiful selection and for once Paisley wanted to have something of her own to pull out on special occasions. One dress in particular tugged at Paisley no matter what part of the store she was in. She caved to the pressure and asked the salesgirl for help. The Gladys is from our vintage collection entitled Rockability. It also comes in white with black polka dots and red. Well, dang. Who could pass up trying on a red dress with a full skirt? Paisley took the dress to the changing room. As soon as she zipped it up, she knew she was in trouble. The dress fit like it was made for her. The bust line came high enough she wouldn't be tugging it up all night and the full skirt made her feel every bit the girl. Squeezing her eyes shut, she felt around for the price tag, whispering a prayer it was in her price range. It was. Paisley hugged herself, well, hugged the dress, but she happened to be in it. Wait till Amber sees this. Paisley paused before slipping out of the dressing room. Who was she kidding? Clay was the one she wanted to see her in the dress. She wanted to be the knockout he believed her to be. In this dress, she would leave him with a lasting impression of what he was leaving behind. Not because she wanted to take away his dream or force him to stay, but so she'd be the one that got away, and not the other way around. Chapter 11 The next day, the day before Christmas Eve, was blocked out for decorating the city building. Paisley stopped in at work to check her email and her voicemail. She also accepted the keys to Tom's hippie VW van. Unlike the soccer mom vans Paisley's friends had to drive to the Friday night football games in high school, this one didn't have rows of seats. Instead, there was a small kitchenette along the side behind the driver and a bench across the back, which left a whole lot of floor space. She transferred the punch bowl and other decorations she'd picked up in Billings from her car to the van. Then, she slid the door shut, confident the supplies would fit in the mustard-yellow monster. 
I'll be over around three to help with the final touches. Small ice crystals formed on Tom's mustache. Paisley eyed the vehicle. Do you think the Ola girl will make it today? It's been awfully cold. Tom shook his head. An apocalypse couldn't stop this baby. She fired right up this morning. I thought I'd have to hook up the cables for a jump, but she did just fine. The van's longevity explained why Tom kept the monstrosity around. Paisley yanked on the handle and climbed into the ripped driver's seat. He obviously didn't hang on to the van because of its condition. Paisley wrinkled her nose. Or, the smell. What was that? She took a tentative sniff. Rotten banana. She twisted in her seat and gave the van a once-over. No way was she going to root it out. Just the idea of a fuzz-covered banana made her gag and she had to roll down the window to let in clean air. Her first stop was the linen rental shop, then the bakery to pick up donuts and a five-foot deli sandwich to feed volunteers. Once she was done there, she made her way to the city building where a small army pulled circular tables out of the storage closet and carried folding chairs in from the council room. Where do you want these? asked Jared, Mr. Volunteer Coordinator, as he hefted the first table off the dolly. Paisley rummaged through her files until she found the one with the room layout she'd agonized over for several hours. The trick was getting enough seating so people felt comfortable hanging out, but providing enough space for those who wanted to dance. She handed him the schematic encased in a sheet protector. This is the stage area, she pointed at the rectangle marked stage. It's along that wall. Sweet. This shouldn't take long. Jared rolled the table over to the right spot and pulled the legs out with a clang. Once Jared got the first table set up, he spent the next half hour directing the crew, which freed Paisley to meet with the decorating committee at the front doors. I'm so excited for the new theme. I was up all night planning centerpieces. Karen tipped her head toward her car. I've got a bunch of stuff in the trunk, too. Awesome. I really appreciate your help. Paisley took an armful of tablecloths out of the van and followed Karen inside. The morning passed and before she knew it, Sawyer and the band came through the door. They carried music stands and extension cords. She held her breath, not sure what she'd say to Clay. He tried to call her several times and she'd let it go to voicemail. He never left a message. Why did guys do that? If whatever he had to say was important enough to make the effort to get her number from Amber or Sawyer, then wasn't it important enough to leave a message? She wanted to hear from him, wanted to listen to the gentle swing of his deep voice. If she could just make it through Christmas, then she could shut the door on her feelings for Clay and not ache to see him like she had been. Amber came in, pushing Journey in her stroller. Paisley smiled and then looked past her expectantly. When Clay didn't walk in, Paisley's eyes went back to Amber who gave her a bright smile and a small shake of her head. Sawyer gave her a one-armed, vice-grip hug. He was more like Dad than he thought. Mom said to tell you she'd be here soon. Thanks. You guys want some food? Paisley motioned to the sub she'd brought in as she opened two bags of chips. Karen, you had better come over before Bill eats everything. They gathered around and Jeb offered grace. Paisley forbade them from sitting at the tables for fear they'd spill on the tablecloths so they sat cross-legged on the floor. Paisley's mom bustled in, peek in tow. She got Peek a plate and made sure he was settled between Sawyer and Bill before she went back to make her own. Sawyer pulled over a folding chair and mom sat down with a sigh. I hear I'm going to be a grandma again. All eyes turned toward Amber who swallowed and took a swig from her soda can. Not me. Paisley. She pointed at Paisley with her drink. The room went silent as every head swiveled in her direction. Who told you that? Paisley demanded. Peek, replied her mom. Paisley and Amber looked at each other and burst out laughing. Don't believe everything you hear. 
Amber dabbed at her eyes as she laughed. Mom put her hand on her hip. What I want to know is where he got such an idea. Honestly, a boy his age shouldn't be talking about such things. Paisley's face went red and she tucked her chin down. Why don't you ask Clay, said Amber. Paisley's jaw dropped and she swatted at Amber who leaned away laughing. Someone had better tell me what's going on. Mom wasn't about to let Paisley off the hook. Paisley gritted her teeth. Nothing. Amber scooted back out of Paisley's reach. Paisley and Clay took Peek to the carnival the other night. I guess they got all smoochy and Peek thinks they're going to get married and have a baby. Paisley put her hands on her hips. That is not what happened. So you didn't kiss him? Amber asked all wide-eyed. Paisley pursed her lips. Ha! <laughs> Guilty by silence, Sawyer said. He and Bill Fist bumped. Paisley spread her hands as if she could smooth the situation with her palms. If you must know Dash, she glared around the circle, including Karen and her daughters in the look, because they paid as much attention to her family drama as Mom did. Clay and I did take Peek to the carnival, but, she held up a finger. I got sick on the ride and since Amber gets sick when she's pregnant, Peek thought it meant I was going to have a baby. There, she'd set them all straight. She folded her arms and dared any of them to bring up the kiss. Well, I'm grateful there's an explanation. Sawyer, you need to have a talk with Peek about what little boys should and should not discuss with their grandmothers. Yes, ma'am. Sawyer had a glint in his eye, the same glint he had the time he promised not to drag a sled behind the truck and went ahead and hooked it up behind the tractor instead. Once they finished eating, Mom got to work unpacking the punch cups. Sawyer and the guys brought in the rest of the equipment and started the long process of attaching cords and connecting power. Peek flitted from here to there and Journey slept. Karen dove into decorating with gusto and the room started to take shape. Paisley had several odd jobs, like unpacking the supplies in the kitchen, to keep her busy. She had just arranged the paper goods on the counter when Amber came in with Journey on her hip. Hey. She filled a spillproof cup with milk and held the baby girl close. You guys have what you need? Paisley asked. Yeah, we should be fine. Do you need help with Clay's stuff? It was kind of rude of him to leave you all to take care of this. Paisley slammed a roll of aluminum foil on the counter. Journey stopped drinking and gave her an appraisal. Paisley made a face and Journey dissolved into giggles. He's got a meeting with the investors today, in person. They flew some guy out to Billings. Two days before Christmas? Paisley gave her a disbelieving look. They want to get the studio up and running as soon as possible. Paisley's. Grr. Smoldered. So, Amber twirled one of Journey's pigtails around her finger. Did you and Clay really kiss? Paisley put the paper towels near the zip-top bags. What if we did? That would be great. Are you guys getting together? No, a Paisley shook out a plastic shopping bag and began to shove the others inside. Why not? Amber blinked. Paisley turned and leaned one hand on the counter. One word, Brent. Amber softened. She placed her spare hand on Paisley's arm. Clay is not Brent. He's not even close to Brent. They don't even reside in the same county. Paisley tied off the plastic bag. I know. I know. Clay's a good guy. One of the best. Paisley, he's a keeper. Paisley tucked the bags into a drawer. Her eyes stung and she didn't want to turn around. Too much stood between her and Clay. It wasn't just the long-distance thing. We're just different. He's all dreams and I'm all spreadsheets and formatting tips. But your differences are what makes the two of you so great, you guys complete each other. Whatever. He'd get bored with me faster than, Paisley snapped her fingers to show how quickly the time would fly. 
her tears brimmed over and she grabbed a napkin to dab at her eyes. Where was this coming from? From her deepest fears, that's where. For two years she'd wondered what she'd done wrong with Brent. Maybe, if she'd been more exciting, more beautiful, or more exotic, Brent might have stayed. After a time, she realized she didn't miss Brent. She missed being someone someone special. Clay made her feel cherished. If she held on and he left, it would hurt too much. So, she had to let go. She couldn't ask him to choose between her and his studio. Being forced into an ultimatum was never a good way to start a relationship. You don't have to be the exact same person to get along, said Amber. You and Sawyer are, and look at you too, you're so happy it makes me sick. Paisley half laughed and half cried at her confession. Amber rubbed Paisley's arm. Honey, Sawyer and I are as different as fire and water. He's laid back, happy to sit behind his drums, and I'm all about showmanship. I drive him crazy, and he mellows me out when I get frazzled. That's why we work. I never thought about the way you guys work together. Journey tipped her cup upside down and several drops of milk splashed onto the counter. So much for spill proof, said Amber. Paisley used a paper towel to clean up the milk. He deserves a chance, Amber said to her back. What if there was a way and Paisley cut it down before they ever had a shot? She groaned. Why did love have to be so complicated? Amber gathered up the empty juice cup and Paisley whipped around before she could leave. Do you think he could? That we could. Does Clay? Amber winked. Yes. Yes. Paisley pressed her hands to her cheeks. That one three-letter word had caused more turmoil for her than all the other words in the English language combined. Leaning against the counter, Paisley wondered, could she do it? Could she say yes, once again? Chapter 12 Christmas Eve came and went. Paisley watched Peek open his gifts and ate dinner with the family in a haze of soul-searching. By the time the band met for their sound check on Christmas Day, she still hadn't come to any conclusions and she steadfastly avoided looking at Clay as the band plugged in. They'd come in regular clothes and would change just before the dance. Paisley did the same, thrilled at the opportunity to reveal her new dress to Amber and if she didn't think too hard about it, Clay, too. She hadn't decided one way or the other if she was going to take a chance on him. It just wasn't an easy answer to come up with. She did face one Christmas ghost, Brent. Brent had messed with her, but she didn't have to let him mess her up. What Amber said about her and Clay balancing one another made a lot of sense. She could see the advantages of being with someone who appreciated those differences. Even so, the miles between Montana and California were pretty lonely. Instead of dwelling on the impossibilities, Paisley took in the decorations. Besides the stunning black and white, multi-tiered cupcake display, with vinyl records hanging from the ceiling above and jars of blue, white, and silver, colored gumballs for decoration, there was an old-fashioned banner hanging across the stage, Christmas trees done up in baby blue and silver, and Christmas swag hung from the back of chairs, the edge of tables, and draped across the walls. Each table had a record centerpiece surrounded by pine sprigs and accented with glass ornaments. The guitars and drum decorations Paisley bought had been scattered throughout the room to take the theme to the right side of pizzazz. What Paisley loved most were the textures. Some were visual textures, like the checkered ribbons running down the punch table or the shiny ornaments. Others were physical textures, like the glass beads, rough tool, and hints of black leather here and there. As the band talked through their pre-show routine, Paisley manned the soundboard, going through their levels one at a time. When she got to Clay, their eyes met briefly and Paisley saw excitement and trepidation in his gaze, though she didn't know if it was because he was happy to see her or just happy to be on stage. The sound check wasn't a quick process, but it was needed and she found peace in the task. It was easy to believe her life would work out when everything did work out on the soundboard. 
Here was order. If she slid the mixer, then Amber's voice sounded pitchy and Amber gave her a dirty look. If she toned it down, Amber sounded like a star and gave her a grateful wink. Why couldn't life be like a soundboard, she wondered as she finished up. Tina arrived in her bakery truck to set out the refreshments and stock the kitchen. Karen and her daughters came next. The girls agreed to keep the cupcake display and punch bowl filled and free from tampering. They'd never had problems before, but Paisley was on guard. If the Adams twins come, steer them clear of anything with frosting, she warned the oldest girl, Miranda. She heard a soft chuckle behind her and turned to see Clay, wearing his black suit with narrow lapels. Somehow, she managed to keep her composure despite Clay's unfathomable good looks. Paisley had the urge to comb his hair off his forehead and had to press her nails into her palms to keep them from going to Clay on their own. Be sure to keep this guy away, as well. He's just as bad. Clay put his hand to his chest and gave them a look of mock innocence. A look Paisley wasn't buying. Clay melted her angst nonetheless and she gave him a real smile. No worries, Paisley. I can handle the atoms. Miranda punched her fist into her other hand and Paisley felt confident in her choice of guards. Um, servers. Miranda went off to find her sisters and Paisley had no choice but to face Clay. The moment she'd been dreading for two days had arrived and she was no closer to a decision than she was to scoring a ride in Santa's sleigh. Can we talk? asked Clay. The most dangerous words in the English language. Sure, but you'll have to walk with me. Paisley started off toward the kitchen without waiting for his answer. Clay put both hands on the counter and leaned forward as Paisley loaded a serving tray with her sugar cookies. I got the loan. She fumbled with a cookie. That's wonderful, she said with true enthusiasm. Above all else, she wanted Clay to be happy and owning a studio would be his dream come true. I'm so excited for you. Clay reached across the tray and touched her hand. I couldn't have done it without you, Paisley. Paisley felt her cheeks grow hot. All I did was make your presentation look pretty. You did a lot more than formatting. You gave me the confidence I needed to push forward. Well, you deserve it, you've worked hard enough. Paisley moved the cookie tray and reached for another one. Clay's smile faltered. What is it? Paisley asked. This is just the beginning. There's so much more to do, and... I was hoping you'd like to help. Paisley shrugged. She didn't know what more she could do, especially from a distance, but she was willing to help. With what? Organizing the business. There's permits to file for, inspectors to schedule, artists to schmooze, production dates and deadlines. He ran his hands through his hair and Paisley smiled when it landed in exactly the right place. Life still wasn't fair. Sounds like a full-time job. It would be, if you'll take it. Paisley sucked in. He was asking her to go with him. For just a moment she held on to the joy rushing through her veins. Then, as she looked around the kitchen at all the donated baked goods, she knew she couldn't leave her home. Clay, she said quietly. The boulder in her stomach was the sign she'd been waiting for. I can't go with you. Snow Valley is my home. Clay's mouth dropped open, then shut, then opened again before he said, What do you mean? Just then Amber burst into the kitchen wearing a stunning 1950s ball gown in emerald green. She had her hair piled on top of her head and a string of pearls around her neck. Paisley. Did you get the ties? They're in my purse. Amber grabbed Clay's arm. We're on in 15 minutes. She pushed him out the door in front of her and called back over her shoulder. I'll meet you in the ladies' room to put your hair up. Hurry. Paisley ran the cookie trays out to the punch table, made sure Miranda and her sisters were ready, and told her mom to open the doors, before rushing to the bathroom to change. 
She slipped into the dress and threw on heavy nylons and the red pumps she'd found in Amber's closet. Amber burst in, a bottle of aerosol hairspray in one hand and a makeup bag in the other. She stopped dead in her tracks when she saw Paisley. No stinking way. Paisley grinned. Worth every penny. She spun and let the skirt fly out around her knees. I love it. Amber squealed and bounced on her toes. It's perfect, right? Amber put her hand on Paisley's shoulder and pushed her onto the folding chair set up before the mirror. You look incredible in that dress. Now hold still and let me tame your mane. In just three minutes, Amber had Paisley's hair pulled up and dug through the makeup bag for black eyeliner. Amber rushed through Paisley's makeup with unnatural skill. When Paisley turned to the mirror, she was stunned to see the woman staring back at her. The lipstick matches your dress perfectly, said Amber. Paisley pursed her lips together to even out the application. They're perfect. Amber pecked her on the cheek. If I didn't love you so much, I'd have to hate you for looking so beautiful. Love the dress. She twittered her fingers as she floated out of the bathroom. Paisley took one more spin in front of the mirror and then bolted for the door. She still had to introduce the band to get the night rolling. There was also an unfinished conversation with Clay. Paisley nodded once as she half ran, half power walked to the ball, in this dress anything was possible. Stepping up to the mic, Paisley remembered why she liked to be at the soundboard, no one could see you from there. With over a hundred pairs of eyes boring into her, she felt the need to clear her throat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual Christmas ball. Pause for polite clapping. Continue. We have a special Christmas treat planned for you. Some of you may recognize the faces up on stage tonight. Please welcome Snow Valley's very own Iron Sticks. Paisley clapped as she backed away from the mic and the band took their places. Into the mic, we are the Iron Sticks and we're going to start off the night with some Jingle Bell Rock. Bill led off and the others joined in two measures later. Paisley liked the tinny sound she'd added to his guitar, but decided to tone it down a bit and made her way to the soundboard. Once there, it was difficult to tear herself away until the sight of the Adams twins snickering near the punch bowl had her striding across the dance floor. They turned tail and ran when they saw her coming and Paisley motioned to Miranda to keep an eye on them. When Jingle Bell Rock ended, the band sang Run, Run, Rudolph, and then Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree. People clogged the dance floor. Paisley noticed April and Wade lost in being together. Big surprise. Everyone knew it would happen one day. The pastor in training, James, spun Jessica across the floor. She was grace personified and Paisley felt the chime of a Christmas miracle to see her happy again. Two of Miranda's sisters had snagged the Adams twins and shuffled their way across the dance floor, their faces beat red and chagrined. Paisley had to give it to the girls, they knew how to keep the boys occupied. When the song ended, Paisley had to scramble to adjust things as Clay set aside his bass and took Bill's guitar. Amber gave the audience a spotlight smile. Here's Clay Jet with Blue Christmas. Clay's voice, as deep as dark chocolate, floated through the speakers and Paisley had to grab the edge of the table as her knees went weak. She closed her eyes. The gentle notes lifted and fell as Clay caressed them forth. Clay's rendition of the Christmas classic told her so much more than the actual words. His longing strummed her heartstrings, setting loose a horde of butterflies in her stomach. Paisley's hand went to her chest where the low notes from the guitar thumped. Two hot tears slid down her face. Who was she kidding? As much as she loved Snow Valley, it would never be the same after Clay. She'd fallen for him, hard and there was no chance of recovery. Her love for Clay, the kind of love that made the whole world look brighter, would taint this town. The cookie party would be boring, the carnival humdrum, and even work, which she usually took great satisfaction in, would be routine. It wasn't spontaneity she craved, it was Clay. 
he was the one who swept the monotony out of her days and replaced it with music. Just hearing him sing was enough to make her heart race and his kiss, oh, his kiss. Her lips tingled just thinking about it. When she opened her eyes, Clay was looking at her. She held his gaze and there was no one and nothing else in the room but her and Clay. The last note hung between them, humming with desire. He didn't move when he finished and Paisley couldn't look away. She had so much to tell him and couldn't find the words. Amber sashayed onto the stage and took the mic, wasn't he great? Thunderous applause sounded and Paisley's eyes swept the room. The rock and roll Christmas ball was the best one they'd ever had. Clay took the guitar off of his shoulder and handed it to Bill who strummed the first lines of Merry Christmas Baby. Taking the stairs two at a time, Clay had Paisley in his arms before Bill finished the introduction. I'll go, she whispered as she reached up to brush his hair off his forehead. I just want to be with you, I don't care where. Clay used his thumbs to wipe away the tears and continued to cradle her face in his hands. You didn't make another bet with Amber, did you? Paisley laughed through her tears. No, this is me. I want to go with you. Clay smiled. I'm not going anywhere. Paisley gripped his arms. But your studio? You can't give that up. Clay tipped his head. Who said I would have to give up the studio? Being this close to Clay made it hard for Paisley to think. She couldn't put two and two together. I don't understand. My studio will be here. What? I'm buying my dad's old barn and remodeling. Didn't we go over that? Paisley thought back to last week. I didn't read the building information. She could have kicked herself. All this time I thought you planned to leave after Christmas. Clay chuckled and Paisley pressed her hand to his shirt to feel the gentle rumble. Clay rested his forehead against hers. Snow Valley is my home. I took off trying to find a dream and all along it was here with sugar cookies, the iron sticks, and this gorgeous girl I couldn't forget. Once I saw you at the tree lighting, I knew I'd never be able to leave again. You could have clued me in. Paisley stepped deeper into his embrace. Technically, I did, he said as he leaned closer. His breath whispered across her lips and Paisley closed her eyes. Like his song had only moments before, his kiss told her so much more than his words. There was longing there, and joy, pure joy that lifted her to her tiptoes. Paisley worked her fingers into Clay's hair and kissed him back, letting go of all her worries and getting lost in the moment. This kiss was one she wanted to remember forever, this was magic. You've been listening to Her Rock Star's Forbidden Kiss A Snow Valley Forbidden Kisses Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell Read by Christina Dimmick All right, well, welcome back. You may have noticed that this was um, a one-sided romance in that I didn't do Clay's point of view for this romance. Part of the reason for that was that the book that it was going in could only be a certain number of pages, a certain number of words to go up for sale on Amazon. They have restrictions on those things. So in order to keep mine within my allotted pages, um, I just told the story from Paisley's point of view, which was a lot of fun, actually, because her angst, I guess you could say, when things happen was not dismissed or whatever from Clay's side. I liked the question of what is this guy doing? Why is this not happening? Why is he over here and he hasn't called and why is he doing, you know, kind of a thing. I, I liked the little bit of mystery that that left. Why don't you leave me a comment and let me know if you liked it as well or if you would rather have both points of view. Yeah, like, comment, subscribe, all those wonderful things that help the channel get seen by other readers and listeners of great audiobooks. And you know what? Thank you for listening. You are very loved and I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day.